and and so uh, in in developing this motion, I I started with that, and and after reviewing the three criteria to evaluate whether an emergency exists, as I as I have in the motion, I I don't believe criterion one and criterion three are met. Uh, In terms of criterion one, an emergency exists involving any fishery that results from recent unforeseen events or recently discovered circumstances. The directed fishery for Bristol Bay Rick and crab has been closed for the past two seasons due to reduced numbers of mature female crab. Recruitment into that fishery has been poor for at least 12 years. And uh, it is um, my overall determination that uh, that in terms of whether uh, an emergency exists relative to criterion one, that uh, the information does not support uh, that the situation resulted from recent unforeseen events or recently discovered circumstances. With respect to criterion three, which is that uh, an emergency exists involving any fishery that can be addressed through emergency regulations for which the immediate benefits outweigh the value of advance notice public comment and deliberative consideration of the impacts on participants to the same extent as would be expected under the normal rulemaking process. I think this is really, uh, this was the critical point uh, in my determination to put this motion forward. And, and again, uh, just reviewing uh, my thoughts in, in going into this. Again, although the analysis does indicate uh, that, that the proposed closure of the Red King Crab Savings Area uh, could provide habitat benefits and, and Bristol Bay Red King crab savings. Uh, I really felt like the, the expedited, expedited nature of the analysis um, made it very difficult to fully analyze uh, the potential for those benefits. And, and so uh, I think there was also quite a bit of discussion through the staff presentation and, and in public comment about also the challenges associated um, with evaluating those potential benefits relative uh, to the potential negative impacts on uh, other uh, PSC species like salmon, halibut, and herring, uh, the potential economic impacts uh, to uh, the fleets from moving to different areas. And, and again, I, under, I understand uh, I'm not being critical of the analysis, but it was an emergency rule analysis. And so I think this criterion is particularly relevant uh, in my consideration in that uh, I, I cannot come to the conclusion uh, that the benefits of this proposed emergency action would outweigh the value uh, of advance notice public comment and, and deliberative consideration of this potential action. And finally, Mr. Chair, I uh, wanted to also cite another component of the emergency rule guidelines that may be a little uh, less familiar to the council and, and the public in that uh, I think it's pretty clear from uh, written comments and, and public comment for this action that this proposed uh, action is controversial. And the policy guidelines explain that controversial actions with serious economic effects, except under extraordinary circumstances should be done under nor nor normal notice and comment rulemaking. And so Mr. Chair, while I'm uh, putting this motion forward for the council to consider that recommends uh, not moving forward with emergency action. I, I really do want to express appreciation uh, for the public comment we received, uh, the very compelling public comment we received with respect to the current situation absolutely is an emergency for participants in the crab fishery. And I think by most normal definitions, uh, it would be considered an emergency in terms of no directed fishery for two years and the really negative uh, impacts flowing from that to all participants. And I understand uh, that there likely will be frustration uh, from those fishery particip participants related to this motion, but I have to uh, point out that this council uh, must make decisions within the framework of the emergency rule guidelines. That is the structure within which we're operating 
and it is my sense that um, the agency will be operating within those same uh, guidelines as well. And, and so I felt it was necessary in putting forward this motion uh, to stay within those guidelines and make this recommendation accordingly. And with that, Mr. Chair, I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Ms. Baker. And let's see if there's any questions here. I would note that, um, that the motion has uh, been posted to our e-agenda. It's available online now. All right, questions on the motion? Okay. If there's no questions, are there any amendments? can go to comments on the motion. Mr. Jensen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for the motion, Ms. Baker. I, I, I agree with your summation of the, and what you uh, commented on here, and I, I will be supporting your motion. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Jensen. Mr. Twight. Thanks, <clears throat> Mr. Chair. Um, appreciate the motion and I too support it. Uh, I um, agree with your talking points as well, and um, maybe slightly duplicative, but also I think diving a little bit further into criteria three in particular, which is the one that always, as, as I was looking at this and, and have been thinking about this action over the last couple of months since we received the petition, I've been thinking a lot about criteria three. Um, and I, I don't think, as I came to the same conclusion that you came to, Ms. Baker, um, that the um, material we have in front of us doesn't outweigh the benefits of, of our normal deliberative process. But I'd like to take the opportunity to dive into that a little bit. Um, in essence, in, I, I think at least for me, uh, I, I'd need to find that I'm relatively confident about the benefits, the value of the benefits in order to um, and have a fair degree of certainty that that they would indeed accrue within the time frame that an emergency envisions. Uh, so I think there's really an implicit criteria there about certainty and confidence that at least was weighing on my mind a lot versus the um, the unknowns um, that have been brought up in public testimony, the range of unknowns. Um, I also thought about this some in terms of not just impacts on red king crab, but um, as has been raised some in the analysis and has been raised a lot in public comment, I was thinking about it as well in terms of potential benefits to habitat. Um, but I'm pretty nervous to begin using an emergency rule process to um, provide habitat protection without some real careful thought about the kind of precedence that establishes and how that works. I'm equally nervous to do it when we're in the middle of an EFH process that's designed to protect habitat, address habitat needs, consider fishing effects and, and protect habitats. And I'm, I was at a bit of a loss just for that practical reason, but equally, I think before I think about emergency rule as a tool to protect habitat, I, I think that deserves some consideration more than it's currently been given to date by either individual councils or by the agency. So I went back to focusing more on potential impacts to um, red king crab themselves. And it's clear as Ms. Baker described that we don't have the level of certainty that I was looking for about the conservation benefits. There was a fair amount of talk about um, that this is the, the sort of situation where we should, should apply the precautionary approach or the precautionary principle. And I personally struggle with at least the way the emergency criteria are structured here and application of the precautionary principle. That application of the precautionary principle, at least in my book, is usually a, a product of a, of a pretty deliberative process. And emergency rules are specifically designed to, um, to some extent, to short circuit that deliberative process. And so I, it, it, again, I, I felt there was a mismatch there that, that um, ended up leaving me thinking that these are issues that are better 
dealt with in the long term. Um, the, and then as we grapple further with these in the long term, because I have no doubt this is, this is certainly not the end of these discussions. This is simply the end of the discussion about is, is emergency regulation the right tool at this point. Um, the unknowns that I'm, I'm anticipating that we will need to dive, uh, take a much deeper dive into over time are, are the, um, how this would fit into our uh, existing efforts to manage bycatch on other species. Um, there's, there's, we, we have to, as, as a council, continue to make sure that what we do to address today's problems doesn't undo the solutions that we've created for other problems. I'm, I'm equally interested in the issue about impacts to the nation's food supply. I, that was raised in public testimony today. It's certainly not mentioned anywhere in the analysis, but it's, it's an issue that I think we should be considering more frequently as we look at these types of challenges that are facing us. Um, I'm interested as well in thinking further about what can be done with newer tools such as gear modifications rather than some of our traditional tools like fixed area closures. I think everybody here has heard me numerous times questioning the value of fixed area closures um, given the, the volatility of, of the, um, the climate and its impacts on the ecosystem at present. So with all that sort of walking through um, in my own mind, um, I, I end up finding that we, we particularly fail on criteria three. That, that criteria three is the one that was the hardest reach for me on this. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Twight. Further comments on the motion? Mr. Mesereau. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I do support the motion and the comments that the other council members have shared. And I guess the only other thing I have to add to that at this point is that we heard some public comment about setting precedents, taking these kind of actions. We also heard some public comments about not really fully comprehending the impacts on other users and that this might be a proxy for actually having a peer reviewed document to determine those outcomes by just having it be the short duration. And I think that is a precedent that um, really changes the way we do business. If we're gonna allow for an emergency action without a full suite of impacts that are analyzed adequately, and then we're just gonna use it to see what happens for six months, and then we can react to that. That is a different structure of management than we've ever done in my time here. Usually we have some peer reviewed science that provides us with the impacts of an action before we take it. We don't take the action and then see what happens. And I guess for me, that's uh, you know thinking that one fleet will just use the tools they have to figure it out. I think when we start taking actions where we're just gonna let people figure out what the impacts are gonna be, we're sort of subverting this council process. And I think that goes back to criteria three and making sure we understand what we're doing before we do it and not just do it and see what happens. And so I guess that was sort of the thing above all else that really resonated with me from the public comments is that this is a different path and this council is considered taking action when that's the reason to take the action or one of the reasons is that we'll see what happens and then we can react properly after that. That's not generally how we do it. So uh, I'll be supporting the motion. I appreciate the public comments and I, I agree most certainly that this is an emergency. It just doesn't meet the criteria of the emergency action. And I hope that before this meeting's over, we can take a look at other ways to do that. So, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mesereau. Ms. Kimball. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I have similar comments, so I'll try to be brief. I, I appreciate the motion and the comprehensive nature of the um, motion and the rationale. I, we're all in agreement. Red King Crab are in a critical situation. I appreciate that they're not overfished or subject to overfishing as the motion states, but obviously biomass and recruitment are at significantly low levels and we have two years of crab fisheries closed. Um, but basically we need to look at whether we can prove up that this action will have an immediate effect on the problem, the situation of low crab stocks that outweighs a full review of the issue. And so I come to the same conclusions that Mr. Twight and Mr. Mesereau do in, in finding concern with meeting criteria three. Um, 
we had lots of testimony focusing on that section in the analysis, you know, page 93, page 94. I've looked at that section multiple times as well. You know, in that concluding statement on, well, there may be savings due to reduction in the amount of crab impacted by gear, the amount and degree that this would positively impact overall biomass of red king crab is uncertain based on the best available science. And whether there's a positive impact at all is so heavily dependent on where the fixed gear and the trawl fleets move and fish in response to the closure. And so I was also troubled by the fact that we have some clear negative impacts on other PSC species, salmon, herring, and halibut to some degree or another, and we could debate that in the future. But I wanna also be clear that I don't think that means that it's outside of the council's purview to consider an action if the benefits are uncertain, or if there's, you know, it's not outside of our purview to be precautionary. It's not outside of our purview to take an action if there are potentially negative impacts, but it, to me, it definitely doesn't meet the emergency rule criteria of being able to do that and show that the rule would provide an immediate benefit that outweighs the value of our regular process, where we would develop a purpose and need statement. We would identify what we're trying to accomplish. We would provide a full analysis of the trade-offs and then make those trade-offs in public. Um, so I, I agree with my council, fellow council members, you know, I feel like if we don't take the criteria seriously, then all of our actions could be done under emergency rule and circumvent the Administrative Procedures Act and the NEPA process. I also think just briefly the discussion around the analysis, just having the discussion we had and the really great public testimony, um, whether you're in support or opposition, but discussion around the analysis and its limitations in part for lack of time, I think show why the emergency rule process is, is rarely used and really only used, at least in our council, for issues that are fairly straightforward with little to no negative impact, um, whether it's on a fleet or on other PSC species. And that's just not the case here. So we have a proxy for bottom contact that we've never seen before. We have one season of data provided to estimate impacts on critical species like Chinook and Chum Salmon. We have some additional statements on habitat impacts that need to be ground truth through data and we didn't have any opportunity for SSC review. So just the level of discussion and testimony on potential consequences or additional information that should be considered, I think indicates that this isn't an issue conducive to emergency rule. So full agreement that the crab are in critical condition, but also agree we can't meet the criteria. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Kimball. Further comments, Mr. Down. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, uh, Ms. Baker, for your, your uh, well thought out and, and well written, and clear um, motion. Um, I, I think uh, from, from my perspective, uh, the, I think I agree with most of what I've heard from other council members here. I think on the criteria one, that, um, you know, uh, um, perhaps that's a decision that, that that, that people could could debate. I'm not suggesting that we do, but it's something that I think could be debated. And um, the short duration of, of this action uh, that that was before us, um, I, I'm not I'm not convinced that I could present a good argument for why why it does meet criteria three, being that the proposed action was was uh, relatively short, would be for one season. And uh, likely, even though the action would be in effect for six months, it would actually only really be effective in the three to four months that the, that the Paul fleet would be in that area fishing for one year. What I'm most interested in, however, is if not this, then what? And so that's the, the question that I think criteria three does lead us to the next step, which is that, okay, if we're not gonna do something by emergency action, we're not doing something by emergency action, because uh, of the value of advance notice, public comments, deliberate consideration on the impacts and all of these things. And, and, and Mr. Mesro articulated those very well. So that, that's what I'm the most interested in. So um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna support this motion and, uh, um, and, and look forward to discussion uh, after the vote on, on if, if not this then, then, then what? What? Are, what would be the the next steps that we would would uh, would take under this agenda item? So, uh, so I uh, appreciate that, and I'll hold the other comments in, until that time. 
I just wanted to, to speak to that and be, be clear, not just uh, vote in support of this in, in, uh, um, in silence, because we did hear an awful lot of public comment in support of, of taking some emergency action, people that do feel that it met the criteria. And I also really appreciated, uh, Ms. Baker, that you went into the, the controversial nature of this and why that actually provides uh, the, the criteria um, as well as the three main criteria that, that there is language that you quoted there that got our attention. I think Mr. Payne spoke to that as well, and I appreciate that. And, uh, and that got my attention too. So I'll support the motion and thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Down, Mr. Williams. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Very briefly, uh, I intend to support the motion and I, I thank Ms. Baker for the uh, uh, clear and concise uh, evaluation that she gave us here uh, to review. I, I just want to make one point and my support, and I'm pretty sure the council's support of her motion, uh, I don't want it to diminish the uh, concern over the situation we're faced with in these crab stocks. It's ex extremely dire. Uh, there's a lot of impacts occurring to a lot of different sectors and a lot of different individuals and support of this motion uh, does not in any way, in my mind anyway, diminish the, the importance of uh, needing to do possibly some additional things as Mr. Downs has said, uh, and hopefully uh, we can address some of those, but I don't want that interpretation of my uh, support to mean to people that we don't uh, understand and believe that there's a, a dire situation going on at this point in time. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Williams. I think uh, we're hearing that the, the, the council at large feels much the way you do. Um, further comments, Mr. Kurland. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I, as you all know, uh, wrote a letter to the council in late September to ask for input on this issue uh, and, and provide input on the request because it's important to me and to the agency to get the council's input on this uh, before, before the secretary makes a determination. Um, and, uh, and as my team and I are, are advising the secretary on that determination. Um, I'll be abstaining from the vote uh, for precisely that reason, uh, because it advises the secretary on her determination on an emergency request. And likewise, I won't speak here to the, uh, the criteria for an emergency, how this measures up to those. But I, I just wanted to express my uh, sincere appreciation to the council and to the public for providing input to help uh, inform the secretary's decision. I really appreciate the very thoughtful consideration of um, all of the many facets of this issue. It is a, a complex and difficult issue uh, with a lot of nuance to it. Uh, very much appreciate the staff and their uh, efforts to pull together a lot of information in a short amount of time. Um, we always make better decisions when we're informed by a, a wide variety of knowledgeable people and their perspectives. And um, although we, uh, you know, this is a bit of an expedited uh, process to, to consider um, at this point. Um, I, I feel that the agency has really benefited from this input uh, from the council and the public and, and just wanted to express my appreciation for that. Thank you. Right. Thank you, Mr. Kerland, and, and thank you for um, bringing this forward to the council and for all the efforts of, of your staff to, to put this together in a, in a short amount of time. Further comments on the motion? Okay, um, we can go to a vote. I would just say I'm also going to support the motion. I appreciate the the everything you know the the, the efforts of of staff, all the uh, the public comments we've received, and uh, the very thoughtful conversation around the table here today. So, with that, Mr. Witherell. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, calling the roll on uh, the motion to uh, not recommend emergency rule. And normally under an emergency rule uh, vote, I would take the Alaska administrator last, uh, but in this case, he's indicated that he's abstaining. So I will just read through the list as normal. Ms. Baker. Yes. Mr. Down. Ms. Drobnika. Yes. Mr. Jensen. Yes. Ms. Kimball. Yes. Mr. Curlin abstains. So Mr. Mesereau. Yes. Mr. Twite. Yes. 
Ms. Vanderhoven. Yes. Mr. Williams. Yes. Mr. Kinnean. Yes. Motion passes 10 with one abstention. Thank you, Mr. Witherell. Okay. Anything further under this agenda item? Ms. Baker. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I, I appreciated that discussion and uh, in, in considering the action that we just took and council member and public comments uh, that we've received thus far on this agenda item, uh, I do have a second motion to offer that has been sent to staff. Okay. We can wait for that to get posted. And we'll look for that to be posted to the e agenda as well. Baker. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move that the council adopts the following purpose and need statement and alternatives for analysis. The Bristol Bay Red King crab stock has declined and is currently at low levels, resulting in a closure to the directed fishery in 2021 and 22 and 2022 and 23. Estimated recruitment has been extremely low during the past 12 years and projected mature biomass is expected to decline during the next few years. The best available science indicates the cause of the decline is a combination of factors related to continued warming and variability in ocean conditions. Given the poor recruitment and low stock status of Bristol Bay Red King Crab, the council intends to consider management measures focused on reducing Bristol Bay Red King Crab mortality from groundfish fishing in areas that may be important to Bristol Bay Red King Crab and where Bristol Bay Red King Crab may be found year round, which may help increase stock abundance and promote achievement of optimum yield from the directed Bristol Bay Red King Crab fishery while minimizing negative impacts to affected groundfish fleet operations, as well as target and PSC species. Alternative one, status quo. Alternative two, implement an annual closure of the Red King Crab Savings Area and Red King Crab Savings Sub Area to all commercial groundfish fishing gears. The existing closure for non-pelagic trawl gear is not changed. The closure would be in effect. Option one, if ADFNG does not establish a total allowable catch the previous year for Bristol Bay Red King Crab fishery. Option two, if the total swept area swept biomass for Bristol Bay Red King Crab is less than 50,000 tons. These sub options apply to either option. Sub option one, exempt hook and line gear from the closure. Sub option two, exempt pot gear from the closure. Alternative three, implement a closure of area 512 for fishing, to fishing for Pacific cod with pot gear. The closure would be in effect Option one, if ADFNG does not establish a total allowable catch the previous year for the Bristol Bay Red King crab fishery. Option two, if the total area swept biomass for Bristol Bay Red King crab is less than 50,000 tons. The analysis should provide an expanded discussion of the performance standard applicable to vessels in the directed pollock fishery and the regulatory definition of pelagic trawl gear. The expanded discussion should include background on the rationale for and information used to establish the performance standard and gear definition to help evaluate whether the performance standard and gear definition are meeting council objectives. Seconded by Mr. Down. Um, and I, I would note that the, the uh, motion is posted to the E agenda. Ms. Baker, if you'd like to speak to your motion. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just try to walk through the main points of the motion, Mr. Chair, since it's rather lengthy. Uh, as we've discussed already today, 
uh, the purpose of this motion is to initiate an analysis of a longer term uh, management action aimed at protecting Bristol Bay red king crab uh, with respect to the impacts of groundfish fishing. The two action alternatives on my motion are not mutually exclusive and both could be chosen. Alternative two is based on the emergency rule request to close the Red King Crab savings area and, and sub area to all gear and uh, proposes making this a year round closure if certain thresholds are not met. Alternative three would close area 512 to fishing for Pacific cod with pot gear based on information in the analysis that shows high red king crab PSC rates in area 512 and that the Pacific cod pot fleet is most likely to move east of the red king crab savings area and sub area if the savings area is closed to that fishery. Option one under each of the alternatives maintains the same trigger that is currently used to open and close uh, the Red King Crab saving sub area to non-pelagic trawl gear. When ADF and G does not establish uh, a total allowable catch for the directed Bristol Bay Red King Crab fishery in a given year, uh, under this motion, an area closure for ground fish fishing would be triggered in the subsequent year. Option two under each alternative creates a new threshold uh, that I'm proposing that includes all crab, not just the portion of the stock that is mature uh, upon which the, the directed fishery tack is based and therefore promotes the goal of protecting smaller crab too and is intended uh, for analysis to be uh, a more conservative uh, trigger, if you will, uh, than just whether the directed uh, Bristol Bay Red King Crab Fishery is open or closed. I've chosen the metric of survey area swept biomass rather than uh, the model biomass because the area swept estimate is calculated directly from the survey and is not subject to changes in model parameters. Uh, and just for a little bit of background on the selection of the 50,000 ton trigger, uh, the time series air, average area swept biomass which is uh, 1975 to present, is approximately 100,000 tons. And my motion proposes to use half of that or 50,000 tons of uh, the long-term average biomass as a threshold that would trigger area closures uh, with the intent being that at, at lower levels uh, of total biomass, uh, an area closure could be triggered to the ground fish fisheries in order to protect Bristol Bay red king crab. Mr. Chair, I did want to speak a little bit to uh, what I've proposed in, in this motion uh, to for the red king crab savings area and sub area, as well as the alternative three area 512 uh, closure to make them year round closures rather than seasonal closures uh, that we addressed in one way in, in the emergency rule. And Mr. Chair, I'd be happy to discuss that uh, further here, but I uh, am suggesting a, a year-round closure based on recommendations from our SSC at the last meeting relative to a Bristol Bay Red King Crab discussion paper that essentially cited uh, some of the gaps in our knowledge relative to locations and distribution of Bristol Bay Red King Crab throughout the year. Uh, and essentially my interpretation of a recommendation that seasonal closures, given those gaps in knowledge, uh, are, are quite difficult uh, to evaluate or establish in any meaningful way. And, and I, my takeaway uh, was that the council consider annual versus seasonal closures. And therefore I proposed that in this motion. Moving on, Mr. Chair, again to uh, the proposed alternative three uh, to implement a closure of Area 512 to fishing for Pacific cod with pot gear. Uh, I believe I spoke to that earlier, but it just, uh, I, in reviewing the emergency rule analysis for the Red King Crab Savings Area, uh, it, it was clear in that analysis. Uh, that if the Red King Crab Savings Area is closed, uh, experience shows uh, that the Pacific Cod pot gear fleet uh, would move east 
where uh, there are also um, known to be crab at various times of the year. And so I was concerned uh, that if one of the objectives of protecting Bristol Bay Red King crab uh, is to reduce mortality uh, from ground fish fishing, that it would be important to evaluate uh, and, and uh, a closure of area 512, where we know there are relatively high rates of, of crab, Bristol Bay Red King crab PSC in that pot cod fishery. And so I've put that forward uh, to evaluate either in conjunction with the Red King crab savings area closure or uh, as a standalone closure. As I referenced earlier, these alternatives are not intended to be mutually exclusive. And finally, uh, the last portion of my motion focuses on uh, the issue that was raised in the emergency rule analysis in front of us with respect to uh, largely the performance standard that's applicable to vessels in the directed pollock fishery uh, and to a lesser degree on the regulatory definition of pelagic trial gear. And I very much appreciated the emergency rule analysis um, providing a, a high level overview of uh, the performance standard and how uh, that might be incorporated into considerations about area closures to protect crab. However, uh, I think it just, um, I really am, I, I wasn't able uh, essentially to come to the same conclusions perhaps that were um, put forth in the emergency rule analysis. Uh, in terms of whether the performance standard uh, may or may not be meeting council objectives. Uh, and so I think in, in the interest of pursuing that issue, which I think is an important one, uh, given the fairly extensive discussion we've had uh, really over the past year uh, about pelagic trawl gear in particular and estimated bottom contact and what impacts that bottom contact might be having uh, on crab I am requesting uh, that the analysis, should this motion pass, uh, include additional information on the background and rationale uh, used to establish the performance standard and, and gear definition uh, for pelagic trawl to really help this council uh, evaluate uh, whether those whether the performance standard and, and current gear definition are meeting its objectives. If there are options to consider uh, revisions to that, I don't have enough information to identify those options right now, uh, but I think further discussion of those in uh, the next iteration of the analysis should this pass, this motion pass would be extremely helpful to the council. With that, Mr. Chair, I'd be uh, happy to take any questions. Thank you, Ms. Baker. Mr. Dillon. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Ms. Baker, for your for your motion and for your rationale. And and as always, you've uh, spelled things out pretty clearly. But there is a couple things that that aren't quite clear to me, even listening closely to your rationale. So, um, under alternative two and on alternative three, for instance, um, we would analyze under alternative two, or would not if in this motion we uh, a year-round closure permanent to the Red King Crab Savings Area and Red King Crab Savings Sub Area. In other words, would the, would this alternative have an option? Would, would we have uh, a choice in selecting that and not picking up option one or two? Or is the only thing that we're gonna analyze option, alternative two with an option one and alternative two with an option two? In other words, are we, are we, are we going to analyze uh, a closure under those? year round without the options is that just for comparison i think that would be very important so i want to be clear that um uh, as to as to what we're asking the analysts to do here thank you mr chair thank you mr down for the question and i did consider uh that issue in in developing this motion my intention is that uh, only options one and option two would be analyzed with respect to a closure. I am I'm very concerned about permanent closures uh, in terms of with no threshold or trigger uh, to change given 
uh, the concerns that we've expressed about uh, potential negative impacts on other PSC species, changes in, in those species distribution and climate impacts. So that is the intention of my motion as put forward, uh, but I did anticipate council discussion on that. And, and if other council members feel differently, I look forward to having that discussion. Mr. Dell. So, so with that answer, I, I understand that, that you're concerned uh, about that, but why wouldn't we do that just for comparison purposes only? It would seem like it's pretty, I want to make sure I use this as either prescriptive or, uh, um, but uh, it, it seems a bit prescriptive to ask only that that be analyzed and that we don't analyze a full close year round for comparison purposes might not be an alternative, but I'm just, uh, maybe, I, maybe I'm not, I'll, I'll, I'll move on, Mr. Chairman. I got another question. I think you've answered my, my question. I do have concerns about that and I can, I can speak to that. Okay. Thank you. Um, so, uh, um, I, I, I've got, I'm gonna hold off there. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. All right. Thank you, Mr. Down. Ms. Van Roven. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Ms. Baker, for your motion. Um, I have two clarifying questions under alternative two, option two. Um, the first one being um, the 50,000. It just says tons, and it seems to me because I always get a bit confused when we get crab numbers that we get metric tons and kilotons. And so I just wanted to clarify what unit we're talking about there. That's my first question. Mr. Chair, thank you, Ms. Vanderhoven, for the question. Uh, that's a helpful clarification. It's metric tons. Thank you for that. And then my second question, I apologize if you said during your rationale and I missed it, um, the 50,000, how did you land on 50,000 and why that number rather than a range to look at? Ms. Baker. Mr. Chair, Ms. Vanderhoven, thank you for that question. And I recognize this is a, a new threshold and uh, essentially given uh, the time frame within which to put this together and consider the analysis and uh, all of the great uh, public comment that we've received, I'll just, tr I'll start with the rationale again and um, then respond directly to your question. Uh, the 50,000 tons that I'm proposing as the total uh, Bristol Bay Red King Crab stock biomass threshold is a metric of survey area swept biomass and the time series uh, average area swept biomass, which is 1975 to the present, uh, is approximately 100,000 tons. And my motion proposes to use half of that or 50,000 metric tons half the long-term average biomass as a threshold to trigger the area closures. It is, uh, while that, that metric was developed uh, with the advice of uh, our ADFNG research staff, I uh, would be open to a range understanding uh, that, that that is, again, a new metric. It was intended to be representative of a, a level of uh, stock reduction that represents a concern in my mind, 50% uh, of the long-term average is reasonable uh, to consider uh, the stock to be levels to be of concern, but not necessarily uh, the same threshold as the ADF and G establishing a total allowable catch, which is based um, largely on uh, the mature estimate of mature female crabs and mature male crabs. So maturity, the threshold of 50,000 metric tons is based on the total biomass of crab and incorporates smaller crab in, in, in a sense is a, I, I'm, I think it's a more conservative threshold than ADF and G establishing a, a directed Bristol Bay Red King Crab Fishery, but I would look forward to discussing uh, potential ranges for that option or further analysis to identify uh, perhaps more appropriate total biomass stock thresholds to consider. Mr. Williams. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, 
Thank you, Ms. Baker, for the motion. One, one question in my mind, we had some discussion over the course of the last couple of days regarding the appropriateness, if you will, uh, at least currently of the Red King Crab Savings Area still being the area that should be the emphasis area. Do you anticipate from your motion that somewhere within this there'd be some evaluation or discussion about the appropriateness? Is that still the right area? Given all the environmental conditions and all of that, is, do you anticipate that there would be some evaluation of that? You know, are we still in the right area uh, to be doing all of this? Is that something that you'd consider? Ms. Baker. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for that question, Mr. Williams. I did consider that and I would love to do that evaluation. My, again, referencing our SSC comments from the October meeting, uh, I believe there were, there were some really helpful uh, and direct comments about our ability to evaluate the Red King Crab Savings Area or, or any uh, area closure really uh, in, in terms of the ability in this case to protect Bristol Bay Red King Crab. Uh, that's not to say we shouldn't try to do that to the extent uh, we can. I guess my expectation with respect to your question, I don't know how much more we can evaluate in terms of is the Red King Crab Savings Area the, the right area than we have already seen in this emergency rule analysis other than to expand on the analysis as I'm suggesting here in this motion, but I, I share your concern uh, about uh, whether a fixed area closure like this area identified roughly 30 years ago is the right area. I, I do share that concern. Mr. Twight. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, Ms. Baker, thanks for a, a well put together motion. Um, as I think about the performance standard um, paragraph there, uh, and I appreciate your um, explanation that weren't ready to actually try to structure that into uh, an alternatives sort of language. Um, I, I wonder about in, in your view, is there some intersection between the thinking about performance standard and um, the work that's ongoing in the EFH process regarding fishing effects? Do you think there's some intersection or some synergy there, or do you view them as, as two pretty separate and parallel efforts? Thank you, Mr. Chair. And thank you, Mr. Twight, for that question. I, I have put some thought into that. And I think the fishing effects, or excuse me, the EFH process that we are currently undertaking uh, my rather cursory understanding of the requirements of EFH is that uh, management action is required by this council if a particular trigger is met in terms of, um, and I don't even know the right term, uh, EFH, Im impacting EFH by the, by the fisheries. But it is my understanding uh, that whatever the results of the current EFH review are, uh, that that will be the best available information for this council uh, to determine the impacts of fisheries it manages on essential fish habitat, in this case for Bristol Bay Red King Crab, and that it may very well be, and I believe this council has in the past uh, identified specific management actions in response to uh, an EFH uh, analysis determination or review uh, to address uh, the most recent information about the impacts of our fisheries on essential fish habitat, even if it is not required by uh, the EFH regulations that and that we have established. And so it is it is my anticipation that uh, these things could this action. Uh, I'm being responsive to the sense of urgency that has been communicated to this council uh, to look at uh, potential management tools to reduce ground fish fishery impacts on Bristol Bay Red King Crab and its habitat, but I, I am well aware of the current EFH process going on and feel like the timing of those two processes might uh, actually work fairly well together, particularly 
uh, if we're going to focus on the performance standard and, and reg, excuse me, regulatory definition of pelagic trial gear, which I think really is the crux of this issue, quite frankly, uh, when it comes to the closure area uh, for red king crab, uh, the, the red king crab savings area and sub area, given all of the input and suggestions we've received with respect to better understanding the impacts of pelagic trawl gear in those areas. Mr. Twight. Thanks. Um, that, that was very helpful. Um, I was thinking some about Mr. Williams's question and your response. Um, and, you know, through my lens of, of some concern about reliance on on fixed area closures um, and thinking as well about some of the attempts that so far haven't yielded much to gather some of the additional um, scientific information from within that area that we hope would sort of elucidate some of the questions we have. And I'm, I'm wondering if as, as we proceed, assuming this motion passes, as we proceed down this path to look at this, um, is there, in your mind, should we just go forward hoping that maybe we'll get some additional information about the, the efficacy of this particular fixed area closure? Or uh, should this actually spur some additional investigations into this particular, your motion doesn't offer any area options and nor am I advocating that it should, but it, it, really, really that's the only thing we have on the table. Are, is, do, you, do you think there's room if we begin to understand that it doesn't have the efficacy we'd hope that do you think there's room for either modification or just obviously there's always room for simply walking away from a fixed area closure. But again, what's your sense of the intersection between potential research and our work on this particular? Ms. Baker. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thanks, Mr. Twight, for the question. I've tried, perhaps a, uh, I'll say it again. Uh, I am concerned about fixed area closures for many of the same reasons that you have uh, communicated. I, I think I reiterated that in my answer to Mr. Down's question in terms of permanent making this, this uh, proposed closure well, these proposed closures under proposed alternatives two and three in this analysis, permanent. However, uh, again, responding to the sense of urgency with the tools in front of us, uh, I am choosing to move forward with an analysis at this point uh, of those area closures. But to answer your question, I personally do think that uh, the ongoing research that we've heard about uh, in terms of evaluating uh, some of the details uh, about bottom contact of pelagic trawl gear, we heard about that at the last meeting, a little bit at this meeting, in order to uh, take a look at current information uh, about bottom contact of pelagic trawl gear, how that fits in with our regulatory definition of pelagic trawl gear, and, and what those impacts on crab might be from current uses of pelagic trawl gear. And if we can, as a general matter, uh, as a conservation measure overall, evaluate ways uh, to mitigate those impacts uh, that pelagic trawl gear might be having on the bottom, in my view, uh, that is ultimately a, a more comprehensive and uh, impactful solution to this issue than any one fixed area closure. I just don't see how to get there right now. And that's why the motion is structured the way that it is. I really appreciate your question. Mr. Twight. Final question. Um, if uh, there's been some discussion about the uh, um, value, at not, not mostly not at this meeting, but in some previous meetings and discussions about this, about the the value of some of the dynamic closure approaches that we've been able to successfully adopt for other bycatch issues. I, I'm not aware that there's as much potential here, but 
particularly as I think about PodCod, but maybe the other gears, there might be some, some value there. This motion doesn't um, appear to contemplate any sort of avenue for industry to come forward with any suggestions about um, dynamic closure approaches they think might work. Um, at this point, do you think we should be encouraging industry to do that as a council, or do you think we should be encouraging industry instead to just focus on what you're putting out here as issues we know we can be working on at this point? Ms. Baker. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Toy, again, for raising that issue. And you're right, this specific motion does not include uh, those requests, which I do think are important. And I would just refer back to the council's action at the October, at the last meeting, in terms of, I believe we did request uh, in general that uh, fishing fleets with impacts on Bristol Bay Red King Crab continue to undertake all the voluntary measures that they brought to us and did report to us uh, that they were implementing in uh, you know, beginning in this year and, and beyond, uh, some of which included, you know, move on rules and um, hotspots and things like that, if possible. There are some fleets, as you mentioned, for which the uh, non-regulatory measures to avoid uh, PSC species that have been implemented in our different fisheries don't work. Uh, for example, uh, the, the tools that uh, the Pollock sector has developed uh, for salmon avoidance, my impression is do not work for crab because they are encountered in a very different way. Um, and so my overall uh, re recollection from our last meeting when we did look specifically at uh, dynamic closures to protect crab in an expanded discussion paper was that it's complicated, and but I feel like this council in the motion at that meeting did encourage uh, industry to continue uh, pursuing those non-regulatory voluntary measures and asked uh, that that those be reported back to the council, I believe, uh, in December of the upcoming year. But you're right, I did not include that here. Um, as a reminder, it's always helpful to do that um, since we do address different aspects of similar issues at different meetings. Mr. Mesereau. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Ms. Baker, for your motion. And <clears throat> now I'm going to have to be that guy that asked a question that you may have already answered adequately before, but it was so long ago that you answered it that I, I'm going to try to take another stab at this. And it's really pertinent to Ms. Vanderhoven's question regarding the total area swept and she had you had mentioned something about ranges and that this was a different way to describe that area and I guess what I'm wondering from that discussion with Ms. Vanderhoven is are you signaling that should this motion pass that the staff explore other ways to describe that area or ranges or would that happen later in the um process when we receive this back? I guess that's my question. And if you answered that already, I, I apologize. That was a while ago that that question came up. Mr. Chair, thank you for the question, Mr. Mesereau. I did not answer that question, so I appreciate it. Again, given uh, the compressed time we had to consider this issue and, and put this motion together, uh, I'll see what council members think about this, but my my expectation would be, should this motion pass, uh, that the 50,000 tons, which is approximately half the long-term average biomass, uh, is a, a starting point, and, and perhaps we could look at different thresholds, 25% uh, of the long-term average, 75% of the long-term average, and, and evaluate uh, what that looks like in terms of how often the area closure would have been triggered, uh, what the state of the directed Bristol Bay red king crab fishery was in those years. Uh, and um, in hindsight, Mr. Mesero, it probably, and Ms. Vanderhoven, it, it probably would have been more conventional for me to include a range. So I appreciate the conversation and I don't want to um, 
without any further uh, direction to staff included on my motion, I hope that that was a sufficient answer to your question. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mesereau. Mr. Witherell. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Ms. Ms. Baker. Um, I'm looking again at that total area swept biomass at 50,000 tons, and I, I can envision a scenario where we have that threshold met, but we still allow a directed fishery, which would create under alternative two, a potentially perverse situation where all gears except for non-pelagic trawling is prohibited from the area. So if you've got a directed fishery, then the Amendment 80 sector could fish in the savings area, but everybody else would be prohibited. Is that, can you see a scenario of that happening? Ms. Baker. Mr. Chair, thank you for that question. I did not envision a scenario where under the status quo or under this motion that the Red King Crab Savings Area would be open to the Amendment 80 sector. That's it. Did I hear the question wrong? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, just under alternative two, it says the existing closure for non-pelagic trawl gear is not changed. So under those current regulations, if as the way I understand it, if there is a directed fishery, then the the fleet can go into the sub area. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thanks, Mr. Witherell, for explaining that. My intention, uh, perhaps this could have been done more cleanly in the motion. Uh, but the intention is that the existing closure for non-pelagic trawl gear is not changed under either of these options. Is that helpful? Thank you, Ms. Baker. Mr. Kurland. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you to Ms. Baker for the motion. A uh, couple of clarifying questions. So under Alternative two, uh, it begins implement an annual closure. I note that under alternative three, it says implement a closure, it does not use the term annual. So is your intent for both of these alternatives that they would be one year closures if the various circumstances are met? Ms. Baker. Mr. Chair, thank you for that catch. Yes, it is my intention that both alternative two and alternative three would be an annual closure if the trigger is met. Okay, thank you. And second question, if I may, Mr. Chair. Um, in uh, the last paragraph, uh, I noticed it presents the performance standard as something to analyze, and it's not expressly tied to any uh, potential resulting action. So uh, just a clarification of your intent there. If the council were to adopt this motion, how do you envision the results of that analysis uh, potentially being used by the council in the future? So, for example, if that analysis suggests that potential changes to the performance standard and the gear definition may be needed, do you envision the council would essentially treat that portion of the analysis as a discussion paper and then initiate some new analysis? What was your thinking there? Ms. Baker. Thank you for the question. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Thanks, Mr. Curlin, for the question. I. Uh, not necessarily. I, I think as we've talked about spe specifically as, as we discussed with Mr. Twight, I think the performance standard and, and the regulatory definition of pelagic trawl gear is an important aspect of the management problem that we are trying to address. I just feel like given that we've had a few discussion papers, for example, on the Red King Crab Savings Area closure, now we have an emergency rule analysis, we have a good foundation of analysis on what a management action looks like with respect to that. The performance standard and definition of pelagic trawl gear relative to bottom contact of pelagic trawl is it, it, the evaluation of that is not uh, at the same state. And I um, could see that if we get a little bit more information on the background uh, of those two things, 
that the council might very well be able to develop options to consider in conjunction with this analysis. So I, um, I wasn't thinking of it as a separate issue. I think it's very relevant to uh, the issues we're talking about here in terms of reducing fishing impacts on Bristol Bay Red King Crab. I just did not have options uh, to offer at this point or a specific alternative to direct staff about what the council's intentions might be because we are at a different stage in terms of the information available to us. Uh, and so that's why it's referenced specifically at the end of this motion. I think it's an important issue, but I was not prepared to develop an alternative or options to include at this time. Mr. Kerland. Um, thanks for that clarification. That's very helpful. Uh, so uh, again, just to sort of clarify expectations here, if uh, that analysis were to come back and if it were to point to the need for some additional action, are, are you thinking that uh, at initial review, that would be a time where the council would would specify uh, exactly what should be included in analysis. Ms. Baker. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I think that is an option available to the council if we feel there is sufficient enough information to do that. Great. Thanks for the clarification. Any further questions on the motion? Any amendments? Ms. Vanderhoven. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I have a short amendment that I have sent to staff, and this will go at the end after the performance standard um, paragraph. <laughs> okay, and the amendment reads, the analysis should evaluate the potential trade-offs and challenges of establishing dynamic closure areas to promote the Bristol Bay Red King Crab stocks. Second. Seconded by Mr. Twite, Ms. Vanderhoven. Um, I think Mr. Twite spoke to this very well in his questions, um, and it, as Ms. Baker noted, we've asked stakeholders. Ms. Vanderhoven, can you pull your mic a little bit? Sorry, my just point it towards cord you a little is bit a little bit short. And oh, keeps pulling I think if you just pull it down, it might help. Okay, is that better? A little bit. Okay, we'll keep trying. Um, I think Mr. Twite spoke to um, this issue very well with the dynamic closures, and as Ms. Baker noted, we've asked industry to continue to work on on these options, and um, with that not being included in the current motion. I don't want us to preclude ourselves from being able to um, consider those if if those come forward during the process. Okay, and thank you, Ms. Vanderhoven. Are there questions on the amendment? Mr. Kurland. Thank you, Mr. Chair, uh, and thank you, Ms. Vanderhoven for the amendment. Um, so I'm, I'm trying to understand what exactly we would be asking the analysts to address here. Um, so would this be a general discussion of trade-offs or would it be asking the analysts to, uh, to present different potential dynamic management areas? What, what's your thinking here? What's your expectation for what would come from this? Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Curlin. Um, I, I see this as being more general. Um, I wouldn't be asking staff to try to come up with dynamic closures on their own. We've had some discussion already in previous discussion papers. Um, and, and so, yeah, I would be looking for a more general discussion on the trade-offs. Mr. Twight. Thanks, Mr. Chair. And this is appearing in, in a if, if it's um, adopted, it's appearing in a paragraph that's primarily about um, performance standard um, that's largely a pelagic trawl gear, but you, by placing it there, you're not intending that this discussion be limited only to pelagic trawl gear, right? You're thinking about it a little more broadly than that. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you for the question, Mr. Twight. Um, I may not have been clear 
when I indicated where this would go, it would be a separate, not attached to that paragraph. Okay, um, Ms. Kimball. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Ms. Vanderhoven. I just wanna be clear in uh, hearing your response to Mr. Curlin. So we just asked staff to evaluate this at our last meeting and they brought us back a paper in October that did just this and provided the level of information we would need that we don't have to create dynamic closed areas. So our, my question is, are you asking them to just cut and paste from our last month's analysis to put into this analysis? Or is this more of just a signal that we're still interested in this concept, but we have no alternatives to implement it? I'd like to, a little bit more on that. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Ms. Kimball for the question. Um, I, I think yes. Both, um, to a large extent, cut and paste, um, and um, again, to signal that we are still interested in new ideas as they come forward. Um, we know that this is a, a lengthy process, and um, with those ideas coming forward, um, we may not have specifics the first time that we see an initial review, but we, we may have others that um, could come forward at that review point. Ms. Baker. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thanks, Ms. Vanderhoven, for the amendment. And I just want to ask if, if perhaps I'm understanding your answers to the previous questions correctly. In terms of uh, dynamic, um, sorry, dynamic closure areas, uh, is it your intention uh, to include both regulatory and non-regulatory dynamic? Uh, area closures under this particular amendment, because I, I, as Ms. Kimball just referenced, I believe in our October uh, discussion paper, we essentially looked at, at both types, uh, voluntary and regulatory types of dynamic closures, but for different fleets. And is your intention to keep uh, this more general uh, in terms of regulatory or and or voluntary measures for all fleets? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Ms. Baker, for the question. Yes, that's my intention. Further questions on the amendment? Any amendments to the amendment? Comments? Ms. Kimball. And just a quick comment. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I I mean, I would support the amendment because I, I think we all have a lot of trepidation about continuing fixed area closures in a really changing environment. But I'm also very cognizant of asking staff to evaluate very conceptual things. We need to start making sure that when we put something on the table for staff, it's specific. It's something that can be analyzed and we're not expecting them to come up with new ideas when they previously provided us papers that say they don't have the information to do so. So I'm supportive in concept, but I just really think we should be careful about continuing this practice. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Kimball. Mr. Twight. Thanks. Um, to the to that point, um, my support for this would be essentially a challenge to industry. Um, you're going to get a cut and paste job unless you bring us some new ideas to um, for some consideration to evaluate both the challenges and trade offs. But otherwise, expect just a cut and paste that'll function as a placeholder would be at least my challenge. Thanks, Mr. Twight. Further comments on the amendment? Ms. Kimball. I think, I'm sorry, Mr. Chair, I'm still um, even on the voluntary measures portion of this or challenging industry, there are gonna be limitations when if this is really directed at pelagic trawl gear, there's nothing they're bringing up in the net in order to tell them what to do. There's nothing they can say, this is a hot spot for us, we should move when they're not seeing that. That's our whole problem with unobserved mortality that I think Ms. Baker is trying to address in the latter part of her motion. But it, this is not a big deal, not enough to hold this up. I just want to be careful. Thanks. Thanks, Ms. Kimball, Ms. Vanderhoven. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, just to, to try to further clarify, I was not directing this only at pelagic trawl, all gear types, um, which is why it's separate. Any further comments? Okay, is there opposition to the amendment? If none, the amendment 
passes unanimously. Um, further amendments on the amended main motion. Mr. Down. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I have an amendment. I, uh, if we can bring up, it's a very simple amendment. If we can bring up the uh, Ms. Baker's uh, amendment under alternative two and alternative three, that I would uh, amend the motion to strike the words, the closure would be in effect under alternative two and under alternative three, the closure would be in effect to strike those two sentences. And with a second, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll explain my amendment. Seconded by Ms. Kimball. Mr. Dell. Thank, thank you so much. I, I, the, the effect of this, I believe, and, and people can uh, you know, make sure that I've got this right, but I think the effect of this, my intention would be that under alternative two and alternative three, that we, we would at least analyze and explore the, the option to have these be uh, year round uh, closures of the, for the pot cod fishery in area 512 and also for the Bristol Bay red king crab fishery in, uh, in the Bristol Bay red king crab savings and supplemental area. The, the reason that I, I, I think that that's important that we analyze that is that we, under this agenda item that we're on, we've just looked at an emergency action that asked for that very thing that now we're eliminating. And the reason that we did that is because it doesn't meet the criteria and, and the criteria is there for a reason. It's because we value these things. We value this public opinion, the things that, that many members of the public have just come here and asked for. And yet we're going to, uh, with, without, with this language in, we have to select either option one or two. And it seems uh, to me to be, um, uh, I, I don't want to use the word frameworking because I, I like to use that word because it makes me sound smart, but I'm not sure I completely understand what that really totally means. But but uh, I don't like to prescribe in advance what we're going to be looking at here. The we've we've just heard from the public. We we we've just you know we're we're as a council we're espousing the notion that. We value advanced notice and public comment and deliberative consideration of impacts and the participants and all of those things. And yet we come with a motion that that is um, that that eliminates the very thing that the emergency action was intended to to do. So I, as much as I appreciate Ms. Baker's motion and the efforts to 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 take this, I, I don't agree that we should be at this point eliminating that. I, I supported uh, Ms. Vanderhoven's motion to look at the problems that we might have with this kind of a, uh, a permanent closure that, that, that is not dynamic or has uh, the ability to move and those kind of things. But I, I think that for what we're doing here, I think it's a bit early to be saying that what we want to analyze is option one or option two. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Down. Questions on the amendment? Mr. Twight. Um, Mr. Down, I got lost in your, um, I thought what I heard you say was that, um, well, I, I understand that your intent is to also analyze permanent closure of the two different areas. Um, but I, I heard you saying as part of the rationale that if we don't analyze that, we're um, not following through on what the emergency rule suggestion was, which I thought the emergency rule suggestion was for a one-time closure for half the year of one area. I, I didn't understand the emergency rule petition to be requesting a annual year round closure of two areas. Am I misunderstanding something? Um, th thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Twain. No, I don't think you're misunderstanding. I, I think that uh, it's quite clear to all of us that the emergency action is limited to, to short duration. Um, what what my comments were meant to, to say was that to eliminate the very thing that the action 
was intended to do, which was on short duration, but on a, I think we've heard a lot of public testimony that indicates to us that there is a sentiment among a great deal of people that feel that this area is important to crab and it should be closed to bottom trawling. So um, I think that's something that, sh that should be should be analyzed. Mr. Twight. Ms. Baker. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Down for the amendment. And following up on Mr. Twight's question, I, I just, I would like your confirmation that I'm understanding the intent of your motion. I, I feel like we spoke already that uh, my intention with this motion is to just evaluate an annual closure that would be triggered by one of these two options, should we meet that threshold. And I think what your intention with this amendment is that in addition to those two options for a, a trigger with which that closer would go away, you would like to see an analysis of a permanent closure with no trigger. Is that the intention and the effect of your amendment? That is the intention and the effect of my amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Ms. Baker. Further questions on the amendment? Mr. Mesro. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Down. We, we've heard a lot in these last couple of documents regarding crab that we've evaluated about the crab moving. And so I guess I'm just wondering what would be the utility of closing an area when we've heard that there is a high likelihood that crab are moving north and west. If we permanently close this and the crab are moving and we find out that that's the case, then we've permanently closed an area that may not be necessary to be closed five years from now or 10 years from now. It seems like just wondering what your thought process was about permanently closing that area when um, we've heard quite a bit about crab moving uh, due to the temperature changes. Mr. Down. Yeah, that, thank you, Mr. Mesereau. I, I think your point is valid whether we did a permanent closure or we did uh, a yearly closure under one of these sub options. It, if things change in the crab fishery, some of these sub options would automatically kick in. So one thing we do know is that, that uh, when this area was created in, 1996, I think it went into effect. So, you know, it's been 26 years since since we've done anything. We One thing we do know is that this area remains very important to, to king crab for each one of those nearly 30 years that the survey indicates that there's a presence of male and female king crab in that area. We also know that through the tagging study, although we've only had one year of results from the tagging study, that many of those crab remain in that area or some of the females are moving to areas that are also already protected. But um, I, I think that this analysis without looking at that for a comparison is, is incomplete. We're, we're, we're looking at only closing this area um, if, you know, under these circumstances where, uh, there was no, uh, attack for red king crab or the biomass falls below a certain thing, I think either way, it's the, it's, it's the same. I think I'm just asking that this be analyzed. Let's analyze the thing that we've been talking about. Let's go ahead and analyze the closure of that area to, to, to trawl fisheries that are on the bottom and let's look at the pot fishery as well. Let's look at, is, is it really appropriate for the pot fishery to be in that, in that area? Thank you. Ms. Vanderhoven. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Down for your amendment. Um, with that explanation, I'm, I'm trying to figure out what you think would be different from the information that was in the analysis we had for this meeting under the emergency rule request. 
because we did look at if it was closed to those gear types. So is, is there something different that you would be looking for on, in this analysis with this amendment? I, I think we've, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, Ms. Vanderhoeven, I appreciate the, the, the question. I, I think we've heard from the, the public and in, including members of all sectors that there's things that in that analysis that, that should be expanded. It did look at oh, a, a, a permanent uh, a, a closure in that area um, to, uh, to all gear types. I think that that information as a background is going to be valuable. I think it should be in this analysis. And I think that, um, uh, and I think it should be expanded for a lot of those reasons that, that were brought up, such as salmon bycatch. Is it, is it, we only looked at one year on the salmon bycatch. There was a lot of things that people brought up that should be, if we're going to look at that again. And I think that um, some of that would be in, Ms. Baker's amendment, but I think that, or Ms. Baker's uh, um, motion, but I think this amendment makes it much more clear that we'd want to look at, at, at that as well. Mr. Kurland. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Mr. Down, with regard to uh, the effect of this amendment on alternative two in the main motion, is it, am I inferring correctly that your intent is to uh, carry forward the concept that was in our October motion that indicated that the analysis that we received for this meeting also could be used as a basis to initiate a regulatory amendment through the normal rulemaking process to close the savings area and sub area to some or all gear types. Is that what you were getting at? That, that, that articulates it better than I have, Ms. Curlin. I appreciate you bringing that up, but that's exactly the intent of this is this is the direction that we've I think we've heard a lot of public testimony for, we've discussed this and, and I think that this is a natural outfalling of everything that we've done is to, to say now that we're not gonna include that seems to, would, to, to me to be a shortcoming. So I appreciate that. Thank you very much. Further questions, Ms. Kimball. Thank you. And I'm not sure if it's a question for Mr. Down or maybe for Mr. Witherall, but, but our basis for the analysis in front of us today only looked at the first half of the year because an emergency rule can only be for six months. So we only looked at effects and trade-offs, for instance, on PSC species for the first half of the year. So given that this is your amendment is to look at a permanent closure year round, I think that's very different from what we looked at in this initial analysis. And it might provide a basis for an approach, but certainly not a basis for impacts. So it, it, even regardless of Mr. Down's amendment, even in the main motion, and so maybe it is for Mr. Witherell, would the analysis look at an annual closure and would we be able to see differences between these two very distinct seasons that have very different impacts on chum, for instance, if we start including the bee season? Or would we be aggregating everything to impacts at the annual level? I think that's important for both the main motion and the amendment. Mr. Witherell. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I can try to answer that. Um, under alternative two, as I understand it, if the council chose, chose alternative two without option one or option two, that closure would apply to all gear types year round. And how the analyst looks at the information to parse out the effects on bycatch for salmon may require drilling down to a month by month type analysis. So I, I, I can't really speak to what, how that would be split out as to A season, B season. It may require even more um, drilling down for that, but the net changes effects would be evaluated and reported at an annual level as well, because it's an annual closure or a, Thank you. Skimble. Thanks for the response. I should let the vote happen on Mr. Downs' amendment, but it, that just gives me some confidence that we'll be looking at a, a more refined level, and if necessary, we can split it out by season and see impacts, given that CHUM is only a B season PSC species. Mr. Mesereau. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, that may have confused me a little bit, so I just want to see if I can clarify that. So, Mr. Witherall, if alternative two with no options selected would close the fishery, then what would be the effect of Mr. Downs' motion? If we already have the alternative two as a way to do that, then I don't understand. Is it that would only be the case if we struck the words that in the amendment, or would that be the case regardless of that? If we choose new, new, either of the options and only the alternative, wouldn't that essentially do the same thing as Mr. Down's motion, or uh, am I missing something obvious? The way, Mr. Chairman, uh, Mr. Mesro, the way I understand the effect of Mr. Down's motion by striking the closure would affect means that alternative two can stand alone okay. without any of the options. Great. Uh, if we don't if the Mr. Mesro's motion fails, then you would, that closure would only occur in the situation where one of those two triggers was met. Thank you for the clarification. Further questions on Mr. Downs amendment? Okay, any amendments to the amendment? Okay, comments on the amendment? Ms. Baker. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you for the discussion, uh, Mr. Down, on your amendment. I, I just want to reiterate the discussion that we had earlier. It, it was my intention not to consider a, a permanent closure of the Red King Crab Savings Area or Area 512, and I based that uh, decision at this point uh, on all of the information we have received to date and all of the discussion we have had about uh, the challenges with fixed area closures in changing conditions in, in moving stocks. And so I did intentionally do that. And I agree. Thank you, Mr. Witherell, for that uh, very clear uh, evaluation of what Mr. Downs amendment would do. I am very concerned uh, about the effects of a permanent closure. And that's why I didn't include that in my motion. And I guess the other comment I had is I, I take a little bit of exception uh, with Ms. Mr. Downs rationale in terms of if we don't evaluate a permanent closure, we are somehow not following through on the second part of the October motion that the emergency rule analysis could form a basis for council action going forward under the regular regular process. I, I have a different view of that. I feel like we got a significant amount of information at, at this meeting and the emergency rule analysis uh, that tended to support my initial concern about fixed area closures. Uh, that remains that I have articulated many times here. Sorry to repeat myself. However, in the, in the interest of uh, listening to the council discussion and reflecting uh, public input, I, I will support this amendment, understanding that it does not signal support in the future for uh, permanent closure, uh, understanding it would be for analysis. Thank you, Ms. Baker. Further comments on the amendment? Mr. Twight. Thanks, Mr. Chair. I um, follow Ms. Baker's logic, but I end up with uh, um, different conclusion. I'm, I'm not going to support it. Um, and I, it, I just really disagree with the characterization that the um, somehow the request for an emergency regulation was a request, an unconditional request for a closure. Uh, it was very much a condition that um, there wasn't going to be a directed crab fishery and um, the abundance was quite low. In other words, it met both option one and option two, and that's a reason for an emergency request. I, it was never, unless I somehow sat through a different meeting than everybody else, um, it, it wasn't a, a request that we examine simply closing under all conditions. Ms. Drabnika. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I share the same concerns as Mr. Twight um, on the amendment and um, cannot support it. I do, um, I know that we all have likely different interpretations of what dynamic closures mean. 
we've heard a lot from the public. We've had a lot of discussion around the table about that being the direction that we want to go. And I, I interpreted the structure of the original motion as getting much closer to that definition, um, absent having more refined information on unobserved mortality and some some type of you know visual trigger that the pelagic trawl gear could base a dynamic closure on. So therefore, I, I think that this this takes us a, a step backwards and um, therefore I cannot support it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Avnika. Further comments? Okay. We perhaps better take the roll on this, Mr. Witherell. Calling the roll on the uh, amendment to strike the words, the closure would be in effect in, under both alternative two and three. Mr. Down. Ms. Drobnika. No. Mr. Jensen. No. Ms. Kimball. Yes. Mr. Curland. Yes. Mr. Mesro. No. Mr. Twight. No. Ms. Vanderhoven. No. Mr. Williams. No. Ms. Baker. Yes. Mr. Kaneen. No. Motion fails four to seven. Um, further amendments on the main motion. Okay. On to comments on the main motion. Mr. Twight. Thanks, Mr. Chair. I'll just be very brief. I am in support of it. I think it's it's really fairly well crafted given what we can actually work on at this point. And I appreciate the the invitation part of the motion to continue work on some things that I think ultimately may prove to be more valuable. But I think um, Ms. Baker did a very good job of of taking what we've got now and and continuing to address the issues that clearly we need to grapple with at this time. Thank you, Mr. Twight. Ms. Vanderhoven. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm, I'm generally supportive of the motion as amended. Um, I, I guess my only hesitation, we did hear in public comment that um, some groups were coming forward with some additional ideas under the work plan agenda item. Um, and I kind of would have liked to have had that conversation and heard those before moving into this, but I, I guess if there's something there that we want to pursue, we can find a way to modify this at that point. Um, and so I guess with that caveat or, or whatever, um, I, I will support the motion. Thank you, Ms. Vanderhoven. Mr. Mesero. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, uh, yeah, I'll support the motion as well. I support the motion for uh, initial review, but I think that we may end up getting some different information back than we got in the shorter document that there was a time limitation. And I'll look forward to, you know, seeing a document that sort of more accurately depicts, depicts all the impacts and sort of better fleshes this issue out and, and give me another chance to consider this if it passes at, at final action. So, so thank you very much for the motion and, and all the work that went in. Thank you, Mr. Mesero. Further comments on the motion? Mr. Dale. Uh, thank, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Although, of course, I would have preferred the, the motion uh, um, with my amendment. I'm going to be supporting this motion. I appreciate uh, Ms. Baker's work on this and, and uh, all the effort that's went into it. But most of all, what I really appreciate, I, I just appreciate that um, that the council's taken the time to talk about some of these things. And although there's, uh, you know, conjecture both ways as to how much of this stuff is new information about bottom contact in the trawl fishery, how much, how that's been around for a long time. It seems to me that, um, that, that from the, from when, when the, um, fisheries effects models came out in 2015, um, that uh, I, I remember myself talking with council staff and I talked with Dr. Harris and other people and 
and it wasn't this, what the, the this information we've got now was not that clear then I, I mean it wasn't to me and I made a good concerted effort so I really appreciate that the council's taken the time to bring this stuff to light and even things that we've talked about on unobserved mortality and these things none of them are comfortable things for us to talk about but it is the it is the information that's before us now and I really appreciate that however this came about that we're now able to have these conversations and in light of looking at things of, of uh, you know, crab uh, bycatch or crab pot uh, uh, entanglements and uh, many of these things I think are 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 good I think that uh, um, you know I think that that we we know that, that unobserved mortality is likely occurring and it, that leads us down a road of well to what extent does that have an effect on these. I think some of this stuff is is just really been um, it's really been a, a good process that we've gone down here. I look forward to the fact that, and I know there's people that probably aren't looking that forward to it, but um, so maybe those are that that that's not exactly the right words. But uh, um, but I personally look forward to us moving down this path and having these kind of discussions that that have, that have. You know, I think the the, the time has come. So, um, I will uh, I'll, I'll leave my comments at that. I've got several pages of notes here, which nobody's interested in, but uh, um, but I, I do appreciate that we're having these these conversations and that some of this stuff has we've been able to to have this 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 type of public comment that we've heard. We've got to hear from all sides of the arguments on on this area and uh, appreciate it very much. And I know we've got a lot more crab stuff on the agenda this meeting. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you, Mr. Down, Mr. Williams. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I, I intend to support the, the motion and I share Mr. Mesereau's hope that with a bit more deliberative uh, and a bit more deliberative approach to this in time that we will get some additional information that may help us solidify our decision making. As I listen to this conversation about this issue over the last couple of days, it, it, it's, it's frustrating that, you know, the, the reason we are here is, is not because of fishing per se, it's, it's environmental changes that have uh, dramatically changed what, uh, what we're dealing with. I, the other thing that came to mind as I was listening uh, late yesterday afternoon, we were talking about if we do this, then this will occur. It, it felt a bit like whack-a-mole where every, you, you, you take an action here and then some other action will pop up. Hopefully some of the a bit more deliberative analysis can help us get rid of some of the moles that uh, keep popping up and trying to make this uh, work. So I intend to support the motion and I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Williams. Further comments? Okay, I, I'll just agree with with you here at the end, uh, Mr. Williams. I'm going to support the motion. I appreciate when we've heard two very different processes discussed today in in motions, and um, I, I think this deliberative approach is certainly the right one. I think the council recognizes that that the crab fisheries in in the in the, in the crab dependent people are in, in um, feeling a lot of pain right now, and but I think this deliberative approach is definitely the right way forward. So with that, I'm gonna see if there's any opposition to the motion. With no opposition, the motion passes unanimously. Thank you very much, Ms. Baker. And thanks again to staff and the public for all the efforts on this. Anything further on C1? Okay, with that, let's break for lunch. Um, Come back at 1.35 and we will continue with our agenda. Just a reminder to the public that we have an executive session at 4, at 4 p.m. today. So we'll come back at 1.35.
Testing, testing the new speakers. How loud is this? Is this much louder? Much louder, better? You want me to blast it? Get some subwoofers in here? <laughs> I am Anne and I am talking. How is my speaker? Is it too loud? It's, it doesn't sound bad right here. It's not like blowing my, my eardrums out. Pretty good. What about from back here? Is that better? Is it okay? Got to go real close. <laughs> okay. Get close, really close. Is it going to be in fact? No, nothing. Hello. It's okay. All right. Test over.
testing, testing the sound from the back of the room. We are in the December 2022 council meeting. The agenda schedule for Anchorage, Alaska agenda items may not be taken in the order in which they appear. The timing and subject is changed as necessary. Backing up against the mic, I'm farther away. All meetings are open to the public with the exception of the executive session, which is today at 4 p.m. Okay. Council, please come to order. Good afternoon. We are ready to get into our C2 agenda item and here to walk us through that is John McCracken and Sarah Rhinesmith. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman. Good afternoon, members of the council. My name is Sarah Rhinesmith, council staff, and with me today I have John McCracken, also council staff. And while staff are putting up our presentation, I just want to provide a quick note that both of us will provide the initial review analysis, and then I'll take a moment to provide 
the crab plantain recommendations at the end of our presentation. In addition to John and I, we have Dr. Cody Zawalski in the room. He's the stock assessment author for EVS Snow Crab. And online, we have Katie Payloff, who's crab plantain co-chair, as well as ADF and G staff. Before we get started today, I want to provide a brief outline of our presentation. Our presentation is largely comprised of three main components. The introduction, in which I'll provide some background on the Eastern Bering Sea Snow Crab stock and implementation of a rebuilding plan. We have a section on rebuilding parameters recommended by the SSC and the environmental assessment, which is the main component of our initial review analysis, comprised of five main sections, including a brief section on monitoring the rebuilding plan. So as you all know, the Eastern Bering Sea snow crab stock was declared overfished on October 19th, 2021. And as required by the MSA section 304, a rebuilding plan must be developed and implemented within two years of the stock being declared overfished. Thus, a rebuilding plan must be implemented for the EVS snow crab stock by October 19th, 2023. In accordance with MSA guidelines, the council began drafting a rebuilding plan for implementation. And at the June 2022 meeting, the council selected a purpose and need statement, which can be found in section 1.1, that detailed that the council must develop a rebuilding plan to prevent overfishing and to rebuild to the stock. Within the rebuilding plan, the rebuilding time should be as short as time as possible, taking into account the status and biology of the stock, the needs of fishing communities, and the interactions of the stock within the marine ecosystem. The shortest rebuilding time, or TMIN, is calculated based on a time frame to rebuild the stock to its maximum sustainable yield biomass, or BMSY, in the absence of no fishing mortality, or F equals zero. If TMEN is less than or greater than 10 years, then the maximum time to rebuild, or TMAX, is subsequently 10 year, years for rebuilding a stock to its BMSY. Section 1.2, starting on page 8, details the specifics of the MSA Section 304 and National Standard 1 guidelines in rebuilding overfish stocks. At the June 22 meeting, the Council put forth recommendations for alternatives to analyze at the initial review. And those alternatives presented were alternative one, no action, and alternative two, establish a rebuilding plan and specify a target rebuilding time to not exceed Tmax as recommended by the SSC. The stock will be considered rebuilt once it reaches BMSY. Under alternative two, there were two options. Option one being that there's no directed fishing until that stock is rebuilt and allowing bycatch removals only. And option two, allowing bycatch removals in a directed snow crab fishery under the current state of Alaska harvest strategy. Since alternative one would be in violation of MSA guidelines, the analysts did not analyze in depth the effects of this alternative as it is not a feasible selection for the council to make under MSA and national standard one guidelines. The rebuilding parameters and establishing a rebuilding plan under alternative two were explored by the SSC in June, 2022 and October, 2022 and ultimately rebuilding parameters to be included for initial review were recommended in October, 2022. Here, I'll just briefly detail the rebuilding parameters that were recommended through the council process and some histor historical information on that. At the June, 2022 meeting, the SSC prioritized two scenarios of recruitment and mortality to be explored, 1982 and 2017 and 2005 to 2019, as recruitment and natural mortality are the primary drivers of the rebuilding trajectory. It's important to note in both scenarios, the projections estimating rebuilding times are consistent regarding the starting population conditions and BMSY that defines a rebuilt stock. Ultimately, the parameters recommended by the SSC at the October 2022 meeting included a recruitment and time frame, recruitment and mortality time frame from 1982 to 2017. The rationale behind this recommendation was based on two factors. First being that snow crab recruitment is projected to be lower in the future than it has been historically. And the 1982 to 2017 scenario had the lowest average recruitment of the scenarios considered. Second, the, nat the mortality event that occurred in 2018 and 2019 appears to have been related to the unprecedented number of snow crab in the Eastern Bering Sea and high bottom temperatures. Although hot bottom temperatures will likely be high at some point over the rebuilding period, crab densities will likely not be. Therefore, the SSC recommended the 1982 to 2017 timeframe as it is the best representation of the stock status of the stock out of the two scenarios that were presented to them. 
From this time frame, the rebuilding parameters were able to be established and resulted in a T-min of six years and subsequently a T-max of 10 years under no fishing mortality. As seen in the table on the slide, the median rebuilding projection times round to the same integer year. However, as shown in the table, there lies a difference between the fishing mortality scenarios that is evidenced by the fifth and 95th intersimulation quantiles for the uncertainty around biomass trajectories during the projection period. Thus, there is a slight difference in rebuilding projections influenced by different fishing mortality scenarios, despite no difference in median rebuilding timeframes. To comply with MSA guidelines of establishing a rebuilding plan, the presented rebuilding parameters were used in conjunction with the proposed alternatives to compile an environmental assessment of the impacts of implementing a rebuilding plan. The EEA analyzes the effects of each alternative and the effects of the past, present, and reasonable foreseeable future actions on five resource components. The five resource components are Eastern Bering Sea Snow Crab, non-target species, including impacts of bycatch on snow crab, marine mammals, habitat, and social and economic components. Ultimately, the analysts did not feel that the impacts to seabirds were substantial and therefore did not include them in the EA at this point. So I'll now move into our first part of the EA, EBS snow crab in section 3.2. And analysts, the snow crab or Chinochetes apelio are circumpolar species and commercial catches in Alaska are concentrated in the Bering Sea. The Eastern Bering Sea population with you, within US waters is managed as a single stock. In the Bering Sea, snow crab are distributed widely over the shelf and common at depths less than and approximately 200 meters. Generally, the spatial patterns in juvenile and adult snow crab distribution are determined largely by ontogenetic migrations linked to size and thermal requirements. Immature snow crab concentrate in colder, shallower waters of the Northern Bering Sea and Eastern Bering Sea middle shelves. The molt mate cycle of EBS snow crab is aligned with spatial, thermal, and habitat preferences. Figure 3.2 in the analysis was taken from the 2022 EBS snow crab ESP that details the life cycle and habitat preferences of snow crab. As mature females molt to maturity, female snow crab mate and extrude new egg clutches each spring, which remain attached to the pleopods on the female's abdomen for a full year prior to hatching. Peak hatching of snow crab larvae occurs in April, and larval duration is approximately 30 days. Snow crab larvae settle from late August to the end of October, and crab enter their benthic adult life stage from January to May, in which they terminally molt and extrude. It's worth noting that previous studies have shown that Pacific cod, sculpin, skates, and halibut are major predators of juvenile snow crab, and the cold pool may provide refuge from predators like Pacific cod that avoid waters less than two degrees Celsius. Juvenile snow crab are especially vulnerable to predation and cannibalism during and immediately following molting. Additionally, in the analysis in table six, you can find the ecological spatial temporal preferences for snow crab broken down by life stage. The generation time for EBS snow crab was also calculated to be seven years based on the literature. The snow crab is assessed on an annual basis to determine the status of the population and effects of the fishery performance on the fishery in the previous year. Based on the 2022 BSAI crab safe, the model estimates of mature male biomass for the 21-22 fishing season was 41.2 kilotons, and it was below the MSST of 91.6 kilotons, and so the stock remained in an overfished state. The 2019-2020 season was the first time a mass mortality event appears to have occurred for snow crab since the survey began and the biomass of important size categories of crab are at historical lows. The observed biomass of males greater than 101 millimeters carapace width was 13.36 kilotons in 2022, second lowest aside from 2021, as seen in table eight. For context, when the stock was declared overfished in 1999, the observed biomass was 52.04 kilotons. Females are also at historic lows, and for the first time in history, the fishery will remain closed for the 2022-2023 fishing season as declared by the state of Alaska on October 10th, 2022. Figure 3.3 and figure 3.4 in the analysis illustrate the spatial distribution of the directed snow crab fisheries in the BSAI overlaid on the shaded cobals area. 
Figure 3.3 three shows the statistical areas with retained catch from the 21-22 season. And figure 3.4 demonstrates the weighted center of catch over time. The footprint of the directed snow crab fishery has remained fairly consistent since 1984, evidenced in figure 3.4, and snow crab fishing occurs over a wide distribution on and near the shelf edge and north towards St. Matthew Island. The historical fishing activity I just presented in conjunction with the current status of the EVS snow crab stock provides evidence of the snow crab collapse in recent years. After further examination, many experts hypothesize that the collapse of the snow crab fishery can be attributed to the marine heat wave event. Snow crab are a cold water Arctic species that is primarily found in seasonally ice covered areas of the Bering Sea with summer bottom water temperatures less than two degrees Celsius. Snow crab have long been proposed as a species that is likely to be negatively impacted by climate warming and the loss of sea ice in the Bering Sea. There are two ongoing studies that are not yet published by Dr. Zawalski et al. and Dr. Litzow et al. that I'm going to do my best to summarize here, but both studies showed that the post-2018 collapse of snow crab I, was, can be attributed to the warming event that occurred in 2018 and 2019. Zawalski et al. used annual mortality estimates from a population dynamics model run on males between 30 and 95 millimeters as a response variable for evaluating the role of a wide range of possible causes of the collapse. Candidate covariates included bycatch, directed fishing discard mortality, cannibalism, Pacific cod predation, the incidence of bitter crab syndrome, temperature, and population density. The model showed evidence for temperature and density dependence as the cause of the collapse with no evidence for an effect of the other, of the other covariates. Orealization or the switch from an Arctic ecosystem to a subarctic state has long been proposed as the important consequence of climate change for Arctic marine communities and fisheries. Litzow et al. evaluated the role that borealization of the Southeast Bering Sea played in the snow crab collapse. The analysis used time, a time series for 13 physical and biological variables to create a borealization index that tracked the transition of the region from an Arctic seasonally ice covered state to a subarctic ice free state over the years of 1972 to 2022, as seen in figure 37. The borealization index identified 2018 and 2019 as the years when subarctic conditions were strongest in the Southeast Bering Sea. And the Litzau et al. found a robust statistical relationship between the borealization index and the snow crab collapse. Here we can see that the snow crab collapse coincided with the rapid warming in the Eastern Bering Sea during 2014 to 2020, with peak warming events occurring in 2016, 2018, and 2019. And annual mean sea surface temperature was well outside of the range of previous observations and 1.9 to 2.3 degrees Celsius above the pre 1950s mean. As previously mentioned, the borealization index identified 2018 and 2019 as the years when subarctic conditions were strongest in the Southeast Bering Sea. And there was a statistical relationship between the borealization index and the snow crab collapse. We see here in figure 37B on the right, the details of the borealization index, whereby negative values indicate more Arctic conditions and positive values indicate more subarctic conditions. In figure 37A on the left, this is the time series with the loadings of the 13 physical and biological time series, or 13 physical and biological variables. And the time series with negative loadings are associated with more Arctic conditions, and the time series with positive loadings are associated with more subarctic conditions. Let's all, all also investigated the likelihood that these conditions will persist across rebuilding and found that it is fairly certain. We can expect to continue to temperatures as great or greater than the critical threshold throughout the proposed rebuilding time in 17% of the years. Elevated temperatures will become more common between 1.5 degrees and 2.2 degrees Celsius warming in 32% of the years, and the North Pacific is expected to exceed 1.5 degrees warming sometime in 2040. All of this evidence provides 
proves that ecosystem drivers should be considered in estimating rebuilding time, as it is likely that climate related events will persist throughout rebuilding and the collapse of the snow crab fishery can likely be attributed to the marine heat wave event that occurred in 2018 and 2019. It is possible that rebuilding to BMSY may not occur under any of the proposed alternatives, given that the predominant constraint on stock productivity is likely ecosystem conditions and recruitment. A complex suite of variables affects mortality of all life stages, but ecosystem conditions especially impact survival from age zero to age seven, when male crab recruit into the mature male component of the population. Due to the uncertain nature of the snow crab stock in recent years, there are several possibilities that may influence the effectiveness of rebuilding the snow crab stock. First being that snow crab have highly specific thermal optimums and habitat requirements that may alter physiological demands as a response to warmer than average bottom temperatures. Additionally, warmer temperatures may alter prey and predator relationships and predator distribution, resulting in a shift in predator prey interactions and food web dynamics. Lastly, the constraints on recruitment will likely persist for an extended period of time despite the implementation of a rebuilding plan. Given these considerations, the analysts assess the impacts on the Eastern Bering Sea snow crab population under the proposed alternative to establish a rebuilding plan. Alternative two, option one would designate no directed EBS snow crab fishery with bycatch removals only and implications of stock will be similar to those seen as a result of the 22-23 fishery. The 22-23 fishing season closure is the first closure in the history of the fishery. Therefore, it's hard to determine at this time what the effects of no directed fishery would be on the EBS snow crab stock. However, given the current biomass and abundance estimates, it is likely that with no directed fishery and bycatch removals only, there would be an increased opportunity for st the stock to continue an upward tick in recruitment. However, I'd like to emphasize that there existed no difference in median rebuilding times under the bycatch only fishing mortality scenario when compared to the state harvest strategy scenario. So any improvement in recruitment is likely minimal with no directed fishery. Serene so Smith, Ms. Kimball has a question. Thank you, thanks for the presentation thus far. I just, before we move forward on effects of the alternatives, wanna um, get your take on some of the bullets on slide 16, and particularly the constraints on recruitment, will likely persist for an extended period of time despite the implementation of a rebuilding plan. And so that statement is, is applicable under any alternative, whether we have a directed fishery as part of the rebuilding plan or not allowing a directed fishery under the rebuilding plan. Is that correct? Thank you for the question through the chair. Yes, that is correct. So then my, my follow-up, I guess, is just on your next slides as you work through the alternatives when we when you reference increased opportunity um, for an upward tick in recruitment or things like that, you're trying to differentiate between the options that we have presented in the analysis, but with that overhanging conclusion that we may not be affecting rebuilding through either of these alternatives if ecosystem drivers are the main component affecting recruitment. Yes, through the chair. I think that throughout our presentation, as we attempt to analyze the difference between alternative one, option one, and alter or alternative two, option one, and alternative two, option two, you'll see that we continue to emphasize that recruitment and ecosystem conditions are likely the primary drivers in rebuilding the stock under any, any alternative option. And this, can I ask another one? And then, I don't know if this is for, for you or, I really haven't thought about this too much, but is there anything in the rebuilding requirements under Magnuson that starts to allow us to account for that, for ecosystem conditions or climate change or things kind of outside the fishery management control to affect the rebuilding timeline? Or do we just provide that for context and still proceed ahead and try to do our best in terms of managing to that timeline? Thank you for the question through the chair. There is nothing that I know of that's in Magnuson Act that uh, details what a rebuilding plan would look like under persistent ecosystem conditions like we are seeing now. I know that in the St. Matt's Blue King Crab rebuilding plan, they were experiencing similar ecosystem conditions, um, but the rebuilding plan moved forward with, as defined by MSA and National Standard 1 guidelines. Follow up and then I'll stop. But So thank you for that. 
respond. So are there opportunities then to check in under whatever rebuilding timeline is, is uh, decided, I guess, at final action, such that we would have to keep providing information to say, if we're not meeting our timeline, th this is the prevailing science to say why. And are there penalties for that? Or do we just continue to provide a justification if that's the case? Maybe you have other examples from other regions. Yeah, thank you for the question through the chair. Um, I note this a little bit at the end of our presentation, but uh, the MSA and National Standard One guidelines outline that there's a biennial assessment of the rebuilding plan and the secretary will make the determination as to whether the stock is making quote adequate progress. Um, and that's ultimately up to the regional office. Um, and as defined, it's on page 12 of the analysis. It states that such reviews could include the review of recent stock assessments, comparisons of catches to ACL or other appropriate performance measures. And so that other appropriate performance measures is what I'd really like to emphasize is the regional office has a, a lot of leeway in what they're determining to um, details whether the stock is making quote adequate progress. So I, I'm not sure I can speak to the penalties of any sort, but I know that there is the biennial assessment that ensures that the rebuilding plan is making progress as, it's, as expected or continuing to make progress. Thank you. Thanks, Ms. Kimball. Mr. Twight. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, and thanks, Ms. Kimball, uh, for opening this one up. Um, and I think this is a subject we may actually need to return to several times. I was considering holding off on this until the SSC, but I think given that we're starting to talk about this now, but Ms. Ryan Smith, th there is another approach that is within the council's purview at this point, and that is beginning discussions with the SSC about at what point do you redefine BMSY? At what point do you take the evidence that you've just walked us through regarding the change in the ecosystem status and and use that as a springboard for essentially saying we're, we're dealing with a different ecosystem we're dealing therefore with a very different productivity curve we're re-estimating bmsy under those conditions that's all within the council process and all within the council control obviously in this case in consultation a close consultation with department of fish and game too but i mean we, we don't have, it's it's overfished because it's overfished relative to a BMSY that we chose, right? Thank you for the question through the chair. Um, Mr. Twight, I, I believe you are correct. And we, the stock assessment author and the SSC defines the BMSY um, and Cody may be able to speak to exactly how they, the criteria that they move through for that. Um, however, the SSC did provide their rationale for the time frame that they had selected, and it was indicative indicative that this was the best time frame of recruitment and mortality that was best representative of the stock to move forward with a rebuilding plan at this time. And so, I can't speak to the criteria in determining a BMSY, but that's what I can say about the SSC's rationale moving forward with the parameters that were selected. Thanks, and I appreciate that. I, I just don't think we should lose track of that it, because I mean that's that's the sort of issue that the national SSC leadership was grappling with when they met in Sitka. Um, is is it what are the criteria for moving on? And I understand completely the SSC's reluctance at this point, given what we know now. Um, but as you as as we more clearly document the the fairly dramatic changes in environmental conditions that we've seen so far that we that we reasonably expect to see into the future at some point we are going to all have to grapple with that and that is another way of of, of essentially addressing these um and i i for me i think it's going to be within the next five years that we're going to begin to have a clear set of tools for determining that there's enough scientific certainty around the kinds of evidence that you were presenting that we should be. But that's, I, I just think that's, you, you've done a great job in the analysis of really laying the foundation for that, but I think we should be starting to think about what the first floor of that looks like too. Thank you, Mr. Twight. Any further questions before we move on? 
Ms. Rainsmith. Thank you. I believe I was on slide 18 beginning my uh, discussion of alternative two, option two. So alternative two, option two would allow for a directed harvest if an opening is triggered by the threshold survey catches under the state harvest strategy. And the EBS snow crab stock is likely to have similar rebuilding trajectories under alternative one and alternative two, option two, due to the nature of the current FMP delegation of tax setting to the state of Alaska. Because a rebuilding plan would be in place, the constraints on fishing mortality could be made more conservative by further restricting fishery operations if necessary to ensure adequate progress. Under alternative two, option one, and alternative two, option two, uncertainty in stock growth persists under all fishing mortality scenarios as seen in figure 2-2 two -two in the analysis. And it is likely related to the delays in the onset of increases in recruitment. The mature male biomass remains low in all fishing mortality projection scenarios for approximately the first four years. In figure 2-2 two -two and table four in the analysis illustrate the average projected response of mature male biomass under both alternative two, options one and two with the associated variability for the estimated mature male biomass trend. In summary, if the speed of rebuilding is the primary metric for benefits to the EBS snow crab stock, alternative two, option one and option two provide no difference in rebuilding timeframe metrics. The main driver in speed of re rebuilding is likely related to recruitment and the conditions that allow for increased recruitment into the population. Ecos ecosystem conditions may improve and improvements would result in reduced natural mortality and increased production and are addressed through rebuilding through continued monitoring of ecosystem indicators. The allowance in the projections for recruitment to eventually increase and contribute to stock growth assume that existing ecosystem conditions, such as the marine heat wave experience in 2018 and 2019, or other constraints on production will not continue indefinitely. Alternatively, if current ecosystem conditions prevail and recruitment remains at low levels, the population may take substantially longer to show rebuilding progress and may never reach the designated BMSY level. That con concludes section, the first section of the analysis. And with that, I'll pass it over to John. Good afternoon, members of the council. <clears throat> um, so I'll walk you briefly through section 3.3, which is the impacts of snow crab bycatch. Uh, just a note that uh, to remind everybody that all the existing management measures that minimize snow crab uh, bycatch would be maintained under the um, their current rebuilding alternatives and the rebuilding uh, program for snow crab. Uh, so uh, bycatch for uh, snow crab uh, in the king and tanner crab fisheries is shown in table 10 on page 49 and I'll just make a note there that the units in that table are incorrect. It's uh, it's just, currently described as kilotons, it's actually in metric tons. Um, the only the other table shows the snow crab bycatch for the ground fish fisheries, this is this table 11. I'll uh, briefly remind uh, the council members that uh, snow crab uh, ground fish PSC management. So trawl PSC accrues to the cobals and in this area is close to trawl directed fishing in the fishery slash sector that reaches the specified PSC limit. And there currently is no uh, bycatch measures um, for, uh, or I should say no PSC and no bycatch measures are currently in place for the non-trawl gears uh, inside or outside those cobals. This slide speaks briefly to how the PSC limits are set. So it's set annually at 0.1133% of the snow crab abundance estimates. Uh, with a minimum or a floor of 4.5 million crab minus an additional 150,000 crab. So the, so the ultimate floor is 4,350,000 4, crab and a ceiling of 13 million, again, with an, uh, um, an additional 150,000 um, subtracted from that ceiling. So 12,000 or 12, excuse me, 12,850 crabs are, um, is the ceiling. And uh, this table is shown in page uh, 53 in uh, table 11 year analysis. Oh, excuse me, that's a figure. So table 11, thank you, uh, provides an annual snow crab abundance and the trawl PSC limit for 2006 to 2023. 
So section 3.3.1.1 provides an overview of previous research on observed crab mortality. Um, there are fishing effects, uh, fishing activities results in crab mortality in ways that are not directly observed. There are two types. Uh, the first type is post-release mortality of discarded crab, and we do uh, handle this via uh, estimated discard mortality rates. The other uh, unobserved mortality is gear interaction at the bottom of the ocean, and we do not obviously have uh, currently have a, a way of addressing this. And so unobserved mortality associated with this type of, uh, of interaction, gear interaction, currently is um, not accounted for in stock assessments, as well as not accrued towards uh, trawl PSC limits. Overall, the studies that are provided in, that, in this section uh, focus on the non-pelagic gear and show that gear modifications to include trawl, uh, trawl raised sweeps as well as foot, foot rope changes do mitigate some of the unobserved mortality. Looking at the impacts of snow crab bycatch, so um, uh, were these so the impacts were evaluated um, by looking at uh, the average snow crab bycatch for the last ten years, and these were modeled. And you can see the results of those result uh, those um, those results in the figure as well as the table below. The median rebuilding time uh, for uh, of six years were the same with and without the ten year average bycatch included in the projections. The reasons for no differences in the median rebuilding time uh, are the bycatch removals relative to the total abundance are small, and then in addition, as uh, uh, Sarah has indicated, the stock productivity. Um, which is a function of ecosystem conditions and recruitment overwhelms the bycatch effects. Model sensitivities uh, concerning unobserved mortality were also explored um, and in which the 10 year average was multiplied times five and times 100. The results from those projections are provided in figures uh, 3-11 through and 3-12 as well as tables 14 and 15 on pages 61 and 62 of analysis. And we've included the tables 14 and 15 for reference in the slide here. The projected rebuilding times were similar to the projections associated with uh, 10 year average, um, within a, obviously with an additional mortality included. The 100 times did add one more year of projected median rebuilding period. Uh, but overall, once again, the stock productivity likely overwhelms the effects of unobserved mortality. In June of this year, uh, the council requested additional information on groundfish PSC to help uh, determine whether the following bycatch measures would affect the rebuilding time. And these, request, uh, these requests include removing of snow crab floor for the trawl fleet, uh, count all of the trawl PSC throughout the full range of stock towards the PSC limit. So in other words, include the PSC outside the cobals as well as the uh, inside the cobals towards that PSC limit and finally, a limit on fixed gear PSC. To address this request, the analysis includes table 11 on page 53, which provides uh, the trawl PSC limits without floors. It also provides information on PSC inside and outside the cobalts through a, a, a range of years from 06 to, or 05 to 2021, and provides historical PSC for fixed gear sectors. Overall, none of the changes in the PSC management that are uh, noted above in the slide um, would increase the rebuilding time since, again, the additional bycatch is uh, significantly less than 1% of the total abundance, and bycatch is not a primary component of rebuilding under the proposed um, projections. Okay, at this point, I'll hand it back to uh, Sarah. Thanks, John. Uh, I'll go into ha the habitat section or section 3.4. So here, our analysts detailed the current habitat conditions, and it is likely that prevailing ecosystem conditions will exist under rebuilding, and these prevailing ecosystem conditions are an extension of those that were already mentioned in Section 3.2 in relation to climate change. Additionally, here, the details of the preliminary 2022 EFH five-year review are included. This was presented to the SSC in October 2022. And the EFH five-year review deemed that snow crab habitat, as seen in figure 318, experienced a cumulative 3.8% habitat disturbance as a result of fishing in 2020. 
Additionally, the EFH five-year review or the analysis that was brought forth to SSC in October comprised a time series of habitat disturbance across the sample time frame from 2003 to 2020. And in recent years, it has, the footprint has remained uh, fairly consistent. As a note, the EFH five-year review process sets the threshold for elevating a stock for further assessment of mitigation at 10% disturbance, which we can see here the snow crab is well below. A further analysis of bottom contact area ratios was conducted by the APU FAST Lab to provide the historical fishing footprint and estimated bottom contact areas in areas with historically high snow crab abundance to estimate how fishing activity has influenced snow crab habitat. And the full analysis is included in Appendix 1. The BCAR analysis, bottom contact area ratio, um, is an intermediate data product of the fishing effects model workflow and is an estimate of bottom contact explicitly over time and space. It's important to note that estimated bottom contact area ratios are not directly equivalent to EBS snow crab bycatch, mortality, or impacts on the ability of EBS snow crab to reproduce and recruit into the fishery. Analysts concluded from the bottom contact area ratio analysis that estimated bottom contact areas and historical fishing footprint has not drastically altered snow crab habitat in recent years. Additionally, the presence of fishing and the current estimates of bottom contact are an unlikely cause of the EBS snow crab decline, which further emphasizes the minimal impact to snow crab habitat as a result of implementing a rebuild of land under the proposed alternatives. As I noted, the full extent of the analysis is presented in Appendix 1, and the reason the analysts decided not to highlight it in the main document was that the analysts felt it important to include the analysis to provide reference for historical fishing activity in areas with high snow crab abundance. However, there are no proposed regulatory management measures under the alternatives, and therefore detailing bottom contact area ratios by gear type felt like it was beyond the scope of the current analysis under the proposed alternatives. So in summary, I do have a question okay. on, on the appendix, uh, but in, if she wants to finish up the, in summary, then maybe that would be a bit more appropriate. Okay. Thank you. In summary, there are likely no negative effects on habitat as a direct result of implementing a rebuilding plan under the proposed alternatives. There's already structures in place to continue monitoring habitat throughout the rebuilding plan, such as the next EFH five-year review, and continued use of ESPs and ESRs on an annual basis. And that concludes my habitat section. Mr. Dunn. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Ms. Ryan Smith. Uh, the, um, on the Appendix A, you mentioned that uh, it, it was included here, even though it was just an appendix, but you mentioned that because we have no management action before us, I'm. I'm still curious as to what the intent of putting this in is. It intent to this for for future management actions that we might want to consider as a natural outfall of this snow crab rebuilding plan, or um, and and then I'll just ask my second question in there too. I'm still confused. If you could just give us a, another minute or so, maybe on how we analyze that, because um, I've I've. I believe I've talked with you. Uh, I, I actually asked questions about this at the crab plan team meeting. That's that's what when that uh, conversation took place. And I've gone back since then with your answers to that. And I've looked at bottom contact area ratio versus just bottom contact area and, and a couple of different terms that we've used in different documents. It's still confusing to me when I look at those maps. Does that mean when I'm looking at the at the the heat map sequence, for lack of a better term, on those? that all of that area is impacted or does it mean that just a, that that's because of multiple toes in that area, it's something less than what's shown on those maps. I'm still confused as, and I'm, I think I'm probably joined by others as well. So I, I'm interested in, in the utility of what's being shown here. Is it for something in the future since it's not, how does it really have action here? And, and if so, how should I interpret that? Thank you for the question, Mr. Down and through the chair. Part of the reason that I chose to include this analysis in the document, as I felt it was important and new information that the council had not yet seen on snow crab habitat and historical fishing activity within areas that are important to snow crab habitat. 
Um, and I felt like in the habitat section of this analysis, it was my duty as an analyst to provide the most recent and up-to-date information. Secondly, I feel that this information, should you or the council choose to look further into areas that are important for habitat, for snow crab, and or areas with high fishing presence and bottom contact um, at another time, potentially not in this rebuilding plan, that is important data that could be utilized in other ways. And so I think that answers the first part of your question. The second part of your question, and I believe in the red king crab um, analysis you guys saw previously, they use bottom contact areas, but not a ratio. And so when discussing this with the analysts at the APU Fast Lab that kind of compiled this analysis for um, us, the bottom contact area ratio is a, a better metric for comparing uh, estimated bottom contact in areas of different sizes. And so in the Red King Crab Savings Area, they were just looking at the savings area in particular, whereas in the Appendix 1, you can see that I have um, compiled the BCARs for four different regions, the COBALS uh, Management Area 513, 517, and 521. And so the reason I highlight the ratio um, is because I felt that that we were comparing areas of different sizes and that is a more um, comparable metric for that. Um, I can go a little bit further into the variability um, in the heat maps. And I personally feel that the time series are a little bit easier to digest as they're a um, cumulative effect over a year. And you can see the bottom contact area ratios in that year across time and providing historical data rather than looking at maps from 2003 to 2020. Um, but when you're looking at the heat map, and I'm going to read off of my notes here, but a BCAR of 0 0.5 would not indicate that 50% of the seafloor within a region was contacted by gear, but that the summed area of the contact would be equivalent to 50% of the area of the region. It can be interpreted as the average number of times a piece of seafloor is contacted within the region, while acknowledging that the distribution of number of times of pieces of seafloor are contacted throughout the region could be highly variable and would depend on the degree of spatial overlap in fishing events. So I think the important thing to highlight there is that there is some variability in these ratios and it is highly dependent on the overlap in fishing events. So fishing events can occur in the same area multiple times throughout the year and there may be bottom contact that is occurring in the same area multiple times throughout that year. So for a hypothetical scenario, if we can imagine 100 pieces of seafloor for which 100 fishing events all contacted the same piece of seafloor, but not the rest of the area, the BCAR would be one, but 99% of that region had zero contact, and 1% of that region was contacted 100 times. And so when you're looking at the heat maps, I think that um, some of those visual interpretations of BCARs can be a overrepresentation of the actual uh, bottom contact that is occurring within the region. Um, I'll stop there and see if you have any follow-up questions. Mr. Doe. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Um, uh, Ms. Ryan Smith. And um, uh, I don't have any further questions, but I, I hope that the folks at the FAST Lab that put this together understand that how much it's appreciated. And I, I think these kind of maps using this type of ratio are gonna be incredibly helpful to us as we go forward, not only with snow crab uh, rebuilding and pondering what management measures may, we may or may not use, but in the red king crab uh, um, and other crab areas as well, or impacts in fishing. So I think it's very, very helpful and it's the first time I've seen this kind of a thing. So I appreciate it very much. Any further questions before we move on? Thank you. So I'll just quickly detail section 3.5, um, the assessment on marine mammals. And so when looking into this, analysts found that the bearded seal is known to forage on invertebrates, specifically less than or approximately 57 millimeter snow crab. And snow crab has been present in 54 to 91% frequency of occurrence in biosampled stomachs. 
The foreseen impacts on bearded seals are dependent on the state of the snow crab stock. Thus, under any alternative two option, implementing a rebuilding plan with intentions to rebuild the EBS snow crab stock will likely have positive implications for marine mammals, as some marine mammals or bearded seals are dependent on snow crab as a food source. The implications of, for bearded seals as a result of the snow crab stock decline may include varying food web interactions. However, the bearded seal is a benthic forager and has a wide variety of prey items, so it's likely that the effects of a decrease in snow crab availability resulted in the bearded seal switching prey consumption to accommodate. So in summary here, there is likely no effect on marine mammals under the proposed alternatives. And with that, um, I will wrap up and pass it back to John. Okay, Ms. Chairman, so now we'll move to the economic and social impacts. Uh, a little bit more of my forte here. So this section provides background information on the fisheries as well as the effects of the two rebuilding options uh, that are under consideration. So starting out with section 3.6.1 on page 68 provides a brief description and a summary of the crab rationalization program uh, to include harvester shares, processor shares, um, catch, process, catch processor shares, as well as crew shares, and how that flows throughout that uh, flow diagram that's included in this slide. Uh, obviously, for further information and a lot more detail, you can refer to the crab rationalization program that was uh, completed in January of 2017. The next section, 3.6.2, uh, provides a brief overview of the economic st uh, status of and trends of the Eastern Bering Sea snow crab fishery. Uh, table 16 in your slide. Um, table 16, thank you, <laughs> uh, provides general statistics on harvesting and processing uh, of snow crab throughout the 2021-22 season, as well as going back to 2005 to 2006. Figures 3-20 and 3-2, 3-22 to provide uh, a, a, a visual of the same information to include vessel counts, uh, catch data as well as price uh, information um, through that period of 2005 to 2006 through the 2021-2022 season. Table 17 in your analysis provides crew and processor employment data for the snow crab fishery. Uh, this slide speaks to the information we include in the analysis. We uh, we included uh, an overview of the economic and social uh, indicators from the ESP. Uh, and as you've uh, heard probably uh, in the past, as well as noted here in the analysis, as well as slide is all of the socioeconomic indicators from the last season of 2021 to 2022 exhibit substantial deviations from the historical patterns as noted in the ESP indicators. So section 3.6.2.2 provides a brief overview of local knowledge, traditional knowledge and subsistence specific to the snow crab fishery. Uh, via a search of the local knowledge and traditional knowledge and subsistence information specific to the snow crab fishery for the crab fleet or for communities that are substantially or heavily engaged in the snow crab fishery uh, produced no results in our uh, database. But obviously there is a vast amount of uh, local knowledge that's available as indicated here. We've uh, provided a summary of the, uh, from the Alaska Bering Sea Crabbers Association regarding a new skipper survey that was done in the last two seasons. Um, and it was administered, uh, like I said, in the last two seasons and had a success rate or response rate of 31%. The participating skippers reported that there were overall a decrease in their encounters, both commercial uh, size males as well as uh, sub-commercial size males in the fishery. Uh, there was also, uh, they were fished, some of them fished deeper due to a smaller tax in the last season, as well as uh, there was greater sea ice extent moving southward compared to the previous years, while others skippers reported no significant changes in their fishing behavior. Uh, there was some concerns expressed by the skippers of the lo low uh, abundance on the grounds. Overall, for the 21-22 season, based on this information, there is continued limit availability of alternative fishing targets combined with the higher operating costs that we're seeing uh, in the past couple of years uh, suggest that the fleet and the communities are experiencing 
uh, overall negative economic impacts despite the higher X vessel price for snow crab during that particular year. And we'll get a little bit more information as we move forward and through this, uh, through this section. Mr. McCracken, Mr. Mesero has a question. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Chairman. Thank you, Mr. McCracken. Just a quick clarifying question. On page 33, you have a series of um, graphs on there that I think you had up there. And I just am trying to um, understand the values that are that you put in. You have um, on the second one, you have the pound sign and then crab and then pot lift and then some values that are alongside this. And I was just didn't understand what those values meant. It's my lack of understanding, not anything else. But if you could clarify that, it'd be great. Um, through the chair, Mr. Mesero, th those are provided. That's how it's provided in the ESP. Uh, and that's uh, in those units there um, so that you can see them. I think for the most part, since every figure in there is a really small figure. And I'm, I'm, to tell you the truth, I really can't speak to them too much because uh, it is definitely in a unit that I'm not used to being um, speaking too much. So. Um, I can speculate that pound crab dash pot lift means number of crab per pot lift. Thank you. Yeah. I don't know if that answered your question, Mr. Ezra. Uh, it's fine. I can catch up with you on the side and we'll figure it out. It, it's not worth the time right now. Okay. Okay. So um, moving to the SIA. So this starts on page 80 of your analysis. This uh, SIA utilizes two different approaches or uses two approaches. The first are a set of tables that are based on the existing quantitative fishery information to identify patterns uh, of engagement and dependency on the snow crab fishery based on the distribution across the communities. Um, the second piece of information is using the information from those tables to provide additional qualitative information or descriptions of the communities that are uh, engaged or substantially engaged in the snow crab fishery. Uh, this approach provides uh, a more holistic context of the subsequent analysis of potential community impacts that uh, occur due to the rebuilding options. Sorry, I keep skipping around on me. Uh, so section, uh, so looking at, we're gonna look at the first set of uh, six tables um, which provides snow crab vessel owner information. Uh, overall, in summary, the number of vessels harvested on harvesting snow crab by community are concentrated in Seattle, Kodiak, Anchorage, and, uh, and Homer and Seldovia, which is aggregated. Uh, and this information obviously is going to look a lot different than when we get to processors. Um, so it's a whole set of different communities that are impacted under the vessel owners as well as licenses and quota shareholders as opposed to shoreside processors uh, and the communities in which they're, uh, they're located in. So the distribution of snow crab for X vessel gross revenue at a community level is Washington at 57% uh, and then Alaska communities at 32% with Oregon and other states representing the rest uh, at 11%. And this is in table 19 on page 83. In general, snow crab vessels average um, Approximately 50% of their X vessel revenue comes from snow crab fishery. Uh, this is on table 20 and uh, on page 84. Of the Alaska communities with vessel owner address, Kodiak at 9.9% of its average annual total X vessel gross revenue was from snow crab. Uh, while Homer and Seldovia was 4.3%. Uh, and then for Seattle is 14.1% of the average annual total X vessel revenue. So in other words, the vessels that are located in these communities, those percentages are associated with those, those vessels in that community and receiving their, uh, their total percentage uh, relative to um, other activities. So the largest share of annual average revenue was from the snow crab, as I've indicated. Um, and that was followed by Bristol Bay Red King Crab, and then finally 
a very small percentage of uh, was from ground fish. So, um, and that's in pay, our table 22 on page 85. And then in prior to 2021, the dependency of the snow crab vessels on snow crab itself range anywhere from 10 to 70%. But in 2021, there was a dramatic shift. Uh, the majority of snow crab uh, vessels were 90 to 100% dependent on snow crab, which was likely due to the closure of the Bristol Bay uh, crab fishery um, uh, in that 2021. This is in table 23 on page 86. The next few tables. Mm. Mm. <laughs> okay, the next few tables provide information on snow crab crew licenses by community and snow crab quota share holders by community. Table 24 on page 87 provides information on the number of crew licenses harvesting snow crab by community. The largest number of licenses was from the Washington state area, uh, followed by Alaska. And, uh, and then obviously within Alaska, it's Kodiak, uh, which had the largest number of annual average crew licenses for snow crab at 61 licenses. Table 25 provides information on snow crab quota shareholders by community. And again, Washington had the largest number of quota shareholders for snow crab at 569. Uh, Alaska had an annual average of about 321 uh, quota shareholders. The majority of quota snow crab quota is, uh, is leased. Uh, and, and between 2012 and 2021, 81 to 89% of the snow crab quota was leased. And finally, in this slide here, table 26 provides information on IFQ leases and the total value of those leases on an annual basis. The last series of tables in the first part of the SIA speak to the processor sector engagement and dependency in and dependency on the snow crab fishery by community. There were five Alaska communities where that were most relevant uh, processors receiving snow crab deliveries to include Dutch Harbor on Alaska, Akutan, King Cove, Kodiak, and St. Paul. At this point, I would like to just uh, note that uh, due to confidential restrictions, as I'm going through the rest of the bullets, uh, for the most part, we had to combine Akutan, King Cove, Kodiak, and St. Paul to protect confidentiality. And so unfortunately, the analysis really can't get to the dynamics of some of the processors who are more heavily dependent on the snow crab fishery than others. Uh, overall combined, Accutan, King Cove, Kodiak, and St. Paul accounted for 46% of their average annual first wholesale gross revenue, while uh, on Alaska and Dutch Harbor accounted for 30%. And this is uh, shown in table 28. The relative to the first uh, total annual first wholesale revenue, 12.6% of the snow crab for the combined shoreside processors in Accutan, King Cove, and Kodiak, and St. Paul, while Dutch Harbor uh, was 12.6% of its total for snow crab. Table 32 in the analysis provides annual processor dependency on the snow crab fishery. And you can see in that table that there are, uh, in, more, in more recent years, um, and actually I think historically too, there are at least a couple of processors, shoreside processors that are highly dependent on snow crab, nearly on 90 to 100%. From the perspective of the communities of shoreside processors, the first wholesale gross revenue from snow crab was 7.5% relative to the total annual first wholesale gross revenue for all combined uh, Akutan, King Cove, Kodiak, and St. Paul, while Dutch was 8.5%. So in other words, of all those processors in those combined communities, as well as the one in Dutch, uh, snow crab contributed 7.5% of their total uh, first wholesale revenue for those aggregated communities, and then Dutch was 8.5%. Section 3.6.3.2 provides uh, an overview of the community uh, communities that are engaged in or dependent on snow crab fishery based on the previous SIA table. So that's that second part that we got to at the very beginning of description of SIAs. And then the next section provides an overview of the CDQ snow crab allocation and a description of the CDQ program groups. The next section gets to the impacts of the two options under consideration. So um, the effects section focuses solely on the impacts 
of the directed snow crab fishery and the participants in the communities. Um, since the allocation of the directed catch is determined by quota shareholders, all classes of quota share A, B, and C, processor shares, CDQ organizations, and those who fish for the CDQ allocations will be impacted by the proposed options. There is also uh, included in the analysis uh, a very brief description of um, you know, indirect as well as induced impacts on the communities from the proposed re re uh, rebuilding programs. And those are, just to remind you, those are expenditures by, for example, local workers in those communities uh, further expending uh, processor wages or uh, vessel, um, vessel owner wages or crew wages in those communities. Um, so they obviously cycle through the community and that's, uh, that would be your induced and indirect impacts. So looking at 3.6.4.1, this provides an overview of the impacts for the vessel owners, crew, quota shareholders, and associated communities. And again, we're differentiating that from the processors and their associated communities. So under option one, the loss of snow crab uh, fishery for six years under the rebuilding program for vessel owners, crew, and quota shareholders would like a range anywhere from uh, substantial to severe. As noted in 23, page, table 23, there are 32 of the 60 vessels which are uh, uh, snow crab vessels, which are highly dependent on the snow crab fishery, um, upwards of 90 to 100 percent dependent, for example. And therefore, many of these vessel owners that are shown in that table, as well as quota shareholders and the crew will be heavily impacted or severely impacted as a result of option one. Those that are highly dependent on snow crab uh, revenue could have some difficulties maintaining their existing credit or their debt instruments, forcing them to either refinance or sell their business, or in the worst case, go declare bankruptcy. When combined with the closure of the Bristol Bay Red King Crab Fishery, there would likely be substantially more impacts uh, accentuated out to those participants. And so the payments on debts instruments could likely lead to even more consolidation of the snow crab fleet, as well as losses of crew positions. From the perspective of the communities of the vessel owners, the crew and the quarter shareholders, they would also likely have suffer a negatively impacts under option one due to the loss of the loss of direct expenditures by those participants in the communities and the loss of indirect and induced expenditures throughout the whole entire community. Communities most impacted are would likely be Seattle, uh, Kodiak, Homer slash Soldovia, Anchorage, Palmer, and uh, Wasilla. The impacts of these conditions uh, would obviously depend on the economic diversification of the community, the economies in which we're speaking of. So for example, Seattle is a heavily diversified economy with lots of industry and lots of uh, different engines governing that document or those, those communities, whereas like Kodiak would be obviously less, um, less diversified. Um, but relative to other communities, Kodiak could also be considered more diversified than say a, uh, a Seldovia or a Homer, for example. So under option two, uh, and remind, this would be where there could be a directed fishery during the rebuilding period based on st uh, state harvest strategy, the socioeconomic impacts could improve for vessel owners, crew and quarter shareholders as there would likely be potential for a directed fishery, which could provide valuable ex-vessel operating revenue uh, during a period of low tax, uh, which could provide, again, crucial ex-vessel revenue to keep those businesses and vessels uh, uh, operating. However, just a caveat there, if the stock is insufficient to be able to support a directed fishery, due to uh, state harvest strategy, uh, the fishery will be closed. And uh, obviously the more times the fishery is closed over that six year rebuilding period, the more option two will look like the impacts of option one. The next section uh, speaks to the overview of the impacts on processors and their associated communities. Under option one, the loss of operating revenue could range from minor to severe impacts and depends uh, again on how dependent the processor is on snow crab fishery and how diversified the communities are and its ability to adapt and diversify. For processors with little reliance on snow crab, we would likely see some expected uh, declines in um, experience, uh, operating revenue due and likely uh, some reduced in processor workers as well as wages paid out. Um, 
and the subsequent drop in expenditures um, by the processor and the workers that are located in those communities, as well as the uh, as well as the processor workers that are live in their hometowns. Uh, for processes that are highly reliant on snow crab, likely socioeconomic impacts would be quite severe for processors and their plant workers due to no operational revenue, likely as well as no wages and no hiring of uh, workers. Communities would also be severely impacted under this option due to the loss of expenditures of goods and services in the community by the processor, as well as the workers in that community, as well as the workers' hometowns themselves and the loss of indirect and induced impacts. As noted in table 32 on page 91, at least one shoreside processor is 90 to 100% dependent on snow crab. Of the 11 processors shown in that table, in uh, table 32, the shoreside processor in St. Paul is likely one of the processors that is most impacted under option one. The, re the socioeconomic relationship between the St. Paul processor and the community of St. Paul results in severe consequences uh, from option one since both are highly dependent on the snow crab fishery. Uh, areas of at risk uh, in uh, for St. Paul are the loss of processor purchase of goods and services in the community by that processor, the loss of purchases by the local uh, local plant worker by by plant workers in the community, the potential loss of processors ability to uh, process alibit IFQ landings, the loss of tax tax revenue from local sales on uh, seafood for seafood. CBSFA's loss of operating revenue from its share of CDQ snow crab allocation and its ownership of snow crab harvesting and processing assets, um, quotas and, and uh, other assets, which would flow to the community of St. Paul. Um, when combined with the closure of the Bristol Bay Ridkin crab fishery, the socioeconomic impacts would even be that much more dire and it would accentuate the impacts just from the snow crab fishery. Uh, again, option two would provide opportunity for a directed fishery uh, under the state harvest strategy, which would provide valuable um, operating revenue to pay processor worker wages, expenditures by processors, as well as the workers and the processors spending um, expenditures in the communities and the tax revenue in the communities and, uh, and operating revenue for CDQ allocations, as well as uh, assets in which they own. So the uh, section 3.6.4.3 provides an overview of the likely impacts of CDQ groups. Under option one, the loss of revenue from the CDQ snow crab fishery would also impact the vessel owners, the crew and the processors, obviously that are harvesting the processor allocation, or excuse me, CDQ uh, allocations. Additionally, several communities uh, would also be impacted due to the loss of this, uh, of expenditures by the snow crab participants, which would include vessel owners, crew, quota shareholders, in the local community, as well as the loss of operating revenue from the harvesting and processing of CDQ allocations that flow to the CDQ groups. Uh, CDQ groups uh, also have ownership in uh, harvesting vessels and harvesting and processing assets, quota share assets, which would also be negatively impacted under the option one uh, due to the loss of snow crab uh, revenue, which could impact communities that rely on this revenue from, this, uh, from the CDQ groups. Um, as well as flowing into their programs in which they operate. Option two would provide opportunity for a directed fishery, again, under harvest strategy, and which would likely obviously provide uh, potentially valuable revenue for uh, CDQ uh, allocation processing and harvesting, uh, and then the expenditures of these participants in the communities in which they live and operate. At this point, I'll, if there's no questions on this, I'll hand it over to Sarah. Thanks. So I'll just provide some context, and I've already briefly gone over this earlier, and monitoring progress of the rebuilding plan occurs on a biennial cycle, and the secretary must ensure that progress made under the rebuilding plan is adequate, and ultimately the regional office will make this determination. Additionally, to assess the stock, we'll continue to do annual stock assessments to look at the status of the stock and population levels and abundance. So in conclusion, I just wanted to bring up the purpose and need statement again to reiterate the purpose of our analysis. In the previous slides, we've detailed the proposed rebuilding plan, including rebuilding parameters, and analyzed the effects of the proposed alternatives on EBS snow crab stock, 
The effects of rebuilding while taking into consideration the needs of fishing communities and the interaction of the stock under proposed rebuilding with the current marine ecosystem. As a reminder, we are under a two-year timeline for the MSA guidelines, and our timeline is currently as followed. So we're at our December 2022 council meeting, initial review of the snow crab rebuilding plan, and the council could potentially select a preliminary preferred alternative at this time. We're tentatively scheduled to take up final action in February 2023. Following final action, uh, NIMS would be implementing a rebuilding plan, and per MSA guidelines, it should be implemented by October 19th of 2023. So that wraps up our presentation today. I just want to provide a thank you to all the, of those that contributed to our analysis and that could be here or are with, here, with us here today. Thank you. Yes, and I'll have to provide the CPT minutes, but I'll pause here for any questions. All right, thank you both. Let's see if there's any questions on the staff presentation. Ms. Kimball. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for the presentation, um, both of you. I, I wonder um, wonder if you could just answer a general question. I, I recognize at the beginning of the presentation, you said you did very light treatment of alternative one because it's not applicable or uh, legal under Magnuson Act. We have to do a rebuilding plan. But also in the expected effects of the alternatives, which is kind of where we try to focus at, at some stage, um, there's really no treatment of alternative one or no kind of reality check on the comparison of the rebuilding timeline if we did not take any action versus our options under alternative two. And I wonder why that choice was made or if it might be helpful just to the public to be able to provide the timeline had we not done a rebuilding plan because I think early on you've said it would look exactly the same. We would have kind of the same rebuilding timeline even if we didn't have this plan in place because of the ocean conditions being the primary factor. So could you provide a little bit more on that or maybe give some thought to whether just for clarity and communication under the expected effects of the alternatives, we should do some treatment of alternative one? Thank you for the question through the chair, Ms. Kimball. I as I noted, alternative one wasn't analyzed as it's not a feasible selection for the council to make under MSA guidelines. But I will note that uh, alternative two, option two, having a state harvest or allowing a directive fishery with bycatch removals and delegating that tax setting process to the state. Um, alternative two, option two looks very similar to what alternative one would look like. Um, and that provides some reference for comparison between the two options. Thank you as follow up. Yes, I I definitely understand that. And I get that from your presentation. And I found that one line in the analysis. I guess I'm I'm hoping for a second version, we could make that clear in the expected effects of the alternatives um, came through in your presentation, not coming through as much in the document. I don't think it takes additional work. But I think for clarity, it would be really helpful. That's my suggestion, not a question. Further questions? Okay. Oh, on to the CPT report. Thank you. So I'll, I'll put my crab planting coordinator hat on now um, and just provide a brief overview of CPT recommendations. They reviewed the document um, at an, a virtual CPT meeting on November 29th, just a few, a week or so ago. And so the CPT noted that summaries of projected tax may be useful for council analysis under option two, and Dr. Zawalski indicated that these could be included in the next document iteration, um, and pointed out that the tax for the projections are calculated at 40% of the ABC, um, and the simplification does not incorporate the more nuanced elements of the state harvest strategy. The CPT also noted that we should define BMSY as how the federal assessment uses BMSY and how the state defines BMSY in its final iteration, as there is a difference between the two, and that the subjected projected tax, um, as aforementioned, should be shown in a figure similar to those for the rebuilding trajectories or figure 2-2 in the analysis for the final review draft. These projections may be used to explore the socioeconomic effects of having a small directed fishery during the rebuilding timeframe. Ms. Ryan Smith, Ms. Baker has a question. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Uh, sorry if I'm jumping the gun, but I, I was interested in a couple of bullets on the first slide, and particularly the recommendation for these 
tax projections. And I, I read the, the full crab plan team report and am wondering what your takeaway as staff was from this discussion, because if I was just going off this slide, I would um, take away that the crab plan team is recommending these tech projections. Dr. Zwolski, you know, indicated there may be some challenges with that. And then I read very clearly in the crab plan team report, any potential estimates of tech or predicted removals in the directed fishery would be largely inaccurate. And so my question is, uh, is there a, a conclusion that I'm missing in terms of whether you're going to consider these tech projections in the next version of the analysis or not? Thank you for the question through the chair. Uh, we do have intentions of including these TAC projections. It would be similar to the projections that are made um, for rebuilding time projections. And I think the statement in the minutes referring to uh, the projections being largely inadequate has to do with the estimation um, in the way that the TAC projections are made and being calculated as 40% of the ABC. Uh, and the state harvest strategy has some of those, um, a different criteria in which they could close the fishery. So for example, under the TAC projections that Cody pulled up at the CBT, the fishery would have been open this year, but the state harvest strategy or the state did not uh, delegate a fishery this year. And so I think if I'm speaking on behalf of the CPT in their minutes, the, the inaccuracies that were described are relative to um, the uncertainties in the projections of TAC. And so they are not a gospel per se to follow that's what the TAC will be in the future years. And I think John may have something to add. Um, thank you. Uh, the only thing I can add to this probably is there was a lot of discussion around the tax associated with the option two and the socioeconomics uh, from the crab plan team, and that obviously lifted into the SSC as well as the AP to try to, given the short turnaround from October meeting to this meeting, uh, obviously we were able to put you know so a pretty good assessment of option one, but uh, we didn't at the time didn't really have a good idea on how to tackle option two because I had nothing to work with. But then, obviously, knowing that the tax were we could work with forecast of tax, I can start to. I think the idea is that receiving some uh, some uh, some requests that we put a little bit more information in uh, option two, other than just a relatively short comparison to option one may not change the picture overall, but it might provide some level of magnitude of consolidation, I think is the idea. Uh, so that was one of the reasons why it was requested at the crab plan team meeting. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank, thank you both for that. And so just to make sure I understand, you, maybe you can confirm, uh, perhaps the actual TAC numbers are less important than maybe looking at a few different uh, potential tax within a range and potential differences in impacts on the fleet associated with those uh, in whatever way you can do that is, it sounds like that that is the intent uh, of that suggestion for the analysis. Do I sort of have that? Um, through the chair, yes, Ms. Baker, I think that's the idea is to, uh, to provide a little bit more clarity on option two. So additionally, there was some discussion at the CPT on how to assess the rebuilding plan. Um, and uh, staff noted that the rebuilding plan is assessed on biennial basis, um, but the CPT noted that a gauge of rebuilding progress is critically important, including potential spatial and temporal variability and recovery, as the stock has shown considerable resilience following historical periods of low abundance. The CPT also supported the status quo approach of one year above BMSY being the criteria for establishing rebuilt status, but does acknowledge potential high variability and in interannual sampling can occur at reduced stock levels and notes the importance of the population model in smoothing these results. 
Lastly, the CPT noted that there were negligible differences between the two options and the rebuilding trajectories and median rebuilding time based on the model projections and no difference in the options with respect to the interactions within the marine ecosystem. The CPT also noted that there is no difference under the proposed options for the conservation of the stock um, and noted their support for a directed fishery as it would not impede on uh, rebuilding the stock. There were a few recommendations to move forward with outside of the rebuilding plan. And the CBT expressed concern surrounding current bycatch levels and impacts on the snow crab population and supported future analysis into current PSC levels and impacts on snow crab. Additionally, the CPT suggested further consideration of structural elements of the crab rationalization program that might be available to mitigate potential differential impacts in respect to socioeconomic effects of a decrease in availability of snow crab. And that wraps up my general recommendations for coming out of the CPT meeting. Thank you for that. Are there any questions? And that concludes the entirety of your presentation. Okay, don't see any questions. So um, thank you both very much. That will bring us to our SSC report. Good afternoon, Dr. Dressel. Good afternoon, members of the council and Mr. Chairman. My name is Sherry Dressel. I am co-chair of the SSC and I'm here to give um, the SSC report on action on item C2. So the SSC received a presentation on the draft snow crab rebuilding analysis, and we appreciated the improvements based on previous comments. The SSC also reviewed this in October, and so there were changes um, that have been made since October. The SSC supports the proposed rebuilding parameters. Those are T min equals to six years and T max equals 10 years, but also notes as, um, you saw in other notes in the document that actual rebuilding time may be much longer depending on what the ecosystem conditions and the actual recruitment are. Uh, the SSC has supported our best prediction that we have at the moment, but recognize that um, actual recruitment and actual ecosystem conditions may, may change. The SSC finds the document sufficient to advance to final action and to allow the council to evaluate the impacts of the alternatives um, pending some revisions and additions as practicable. So we had a few suggestions and the first one was, um, you just received a report talk, talking about uh, habitat disturbance. And this currently, um, the suggestion was to make an additional calculation of habitat disturbance that ex excludes the Northern Bering Sea. And this is the area that's outside the currently assessed stock area. And also an evaluation of, and these are two different things. The second one is the evaluation of disturbance in areas with identified higher abundance of smallest size classes. The second suggestion is SSC supports the CPT recommendation to report a projected catch series during the rebuilding period and to use these catches as the basis for evaluation of the potential magnitude of the fishery and potential socioeconomic impacts. Recognize the recognizing the difference in reference points that are used by the state and in the federal process, the SEC suggests additional description of the terms used and the differences between the processes. The SEC got into some discussion of 
there definitely is description of the terms and description of the processes in the document. Um, but we definitely got into a discussion of trying to understand how those differ and how those um, interact. The SSC uh, acknowledged that the robust social impact assessment um, that was part of the plan. And there were a couple of requests and there were a couple of highlights. The SSC requested clarification of the next steps that would be appropriate when the use of uh, the newly developed local knowledge, traditional knowledge and subsistence search engine does not produce specific results, which is uh, the case for this analysis. The SSC highlighted uh, the utility of the inclusion of the local knowledge information that was developed by industry, and that was through the skipper surveys. And the SSC noted the innovation of um, some of the tables that were in this document uh, that highlighted snow crab dependency in the context of co-occurring other changes that are happening for our other crab fisheries. And finally, uh, the S SSC, let's see if I can get to that. Uh, the, the SSC requests inclusion of additional information on the status of fishing communities, especially with regard to the 2021 and 22 fishing season. And what we mean there is that when this analysis started, there may be more information available now on what the conditions were in this past year um, when snow crab uh, were lower than there were when this analysis was started. And so if there's additional information, uh, we asked if that could be included. And I believe that's the end of my uh, presentation. So I'm glad to take questions. All right, thank you, Dr. Dressel. Um, we'll see if there's any questions. I'd like to remind members of the public who wish to testify on this agenda item would please sign up prior to the end of the AP report, which we'll take next. Questions, Ms. Drabnika. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much, Sherry, for your um, report. Um, on the second slide, the recommendation to um, evaluate additional habitat disturbance, um, excluding the Northern Bar Bering Sea, were there, um, I mean, could you provide a little more detail? I, I, I wasn't able to listen in on the SSC's conversation on this, but any specific areas that were preliminary identified or how the council should prioritize um, this effort in the context of other crab-related priorities? Thanks. Sure. Through the through the chair, um, Ms. Drab, sorry about that. <laughs> My best attempt. Um, yes, the one of the things that actually was just in the presentation was that um, the Eastern Bering Sea experienced 3.8% of habitat disturbance. And so that's pretty much how much just um, it's relative to the area examined. So in other words, a disturbance per area. And right now, the way that snow crab is assessed, so what you saw in the EFH um, maps that were put on the screen is that's a distribution of snow crab, but the area over which it's actually assessed right now is actually in only in the Eastern Bering Sea, not in the Northern Bering Sea. And so, but the metric of habitat disturbance includes the northern Bering Sea. And so I think the focus that the SSC or the point that the SSC was trying to recognize was that you have information now on the habitat disturbance over the stock range. But what that doesn't give you is it's mostly because our stock assessment um, area and the stock area aren't the same. And so what we were trying to say is that in the area where the stock is assessed, um, we don't have another number. So we don't know what the habitat disturbance is in the Eastern Bering Sea. And we do know that the habitat disturbance in the Northern Bering Sea is usually lower. And in that case, so this 3.8% may not represent what's in the stock area. And the reasons that I can think that that might matter um, would be a couple of things. Um, one would be, that there's no difference in size between crab in the Eastern Bering Sea and then as you go north. And so you'd see the habitat disturbance on some sizes of crab, possibly more than others. So in other words, the sizes, you don't have them split out between the stock assessment area and otherwise. Um, depending on how much movement there is, you'd also may have different portions of the population. And so it was mostly trying to provide you with the information 
sort of complete information or more information on how this affects the stock assessed area since it's different than the whole distribution. Mr. Clay. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, and thanks, Dr. Dressel. The, uh, th as throughout this process of, of work on first developing a rebuilding model and now beginning to draft the rebuilding plan, I know the SSC has sort of wrestled several times with the question of what's the right picture of productivity for this population? Is it the conditions that it has been experiencing that historically we understand fairly well? Is it the current sort of more chaotic conditions? Or is it these future conditions that we're all sort of agreeing will likely be worse and, and think of fairly high probability of, of, of occurring? I know when the SSC sort of wrestled with that last, they decided to basically continue using the current ones for a variety of reasons. Um, and that there's risk in, in sort of prematurely decreasing our assessment of the productivity. Um, but it strikes me that equally there's a risk of continuing to expect more out of this stock than it's ever going to be able to give. And, and so there's a, there's a science question there. There's a policy question there as well, I think, in terms of how do you want to balance the risks. So I guess I'm, the question I have is, where is the SSC in terms of being able to give the council some both tools to, to wrestle with that question, but equally an indication of now's the time to be seriously debating that question. What's, and, and I, sorry, this is my usual lengthy question, but I'm asking it about snow crab, but equally I know it's also, it's gonna be more and more a programmatic question for us across a broader range of species than just snow crab. That may be just sort of the poster child for this issue right now. Through the chair, Mr. Choi, I'm really glad you specified at the end sort of what the focus was, because I see our application of this for snow crab slightly different than I would apply to other species. Um, because in the work that the authors done and um, other staff at the Alaska Fisheries Science Center, it's interesting because they found we're using the time frame from 1982 to 2017. So essentially, we're using time from the past productivity. So in other words, if temperature affects what recruitment is, how variable recruitment is, essentially, as temperature changes, you may want to represent recruitment and natural mortality in a different way. And so what the SSC, what the crab plant team chose of the options that the SSC gave and what the SSC supported was a past time frame, which was not where we started. We actually started wanting to look at sort of the current time frame that goes all the way up to 2021. And that includes that big jump in 2018 and 19. And so we were starting to acknowledge there may be a heat wave that comes in through climate change, it's predicted that way and that'll affect snow crab. But what they found with additional research at the Alaska Fisheries Science Center is that what happened to snow crab was twofold. It was that because of the heat, and this is my, this is my description of it, so it may not be perfect, but because of the heat, the snow crab ended up in a, in a very concentrated in a certain place. And as they were concentrated, they essentially ran out of food because with warmer weather, sorry, warmer water, um, it, their metabolism goes up. And so what they found is that you actually need to have, we need to look at these heat waves, which are gonna happen with climate change. But then you also, if, if you apply that to snow crab, if snow crab's problem was that they ran out of food, well, now there aren't as many snow crab. So if we have heat waves that may happen, but they may not run out of food because there aren't as many of them any longer. And so our choice of this past time period is representing that unless you have the heat wave and density dependence or concentrated crab, you may not have you, the best predictor of the future now that there aren't as many may actually be conditions of the past. That's why we chose them. It's very unusual. And it's only because of the research that's been done at the, at the Fishery Science Center, which was phenomenal. So 
Um, otherwise, we would have ended up with a different recommendation. And that would have been either what has happened currently, which is having a heat wave every seven years, or ha having what we think is going to be in the future, which would be a heat wave every one to three years. And we didn't. So that was for snow crab. But the concept in general that you were talking about for other species, it is very real and it is very present. And where you see the SSC end up in circles, and you'll hear this um, for a couple of stocks this year is trying to figure out what to do with recruitment because it's affected by climate change and um, the level of recruitment, what average and also how variable it is. And then the other thing that we're struggling with is, so it's, it's those pieces, um, but then also there are some times where you take a series of years to represent conditions in the future. Well, if conditions in the future are different than past years, what years do you use? And so those are the places where the SSC has gotten hung up and we've ended up, so the productivity topic that Mr. Todd asked about is, we talked about it at the SSC, National SSC um, workshop, which was great. Cody gave a presentation on what he's calling the productivity paradox, which is essentially, when do you accept that a stock is going down and never going to come back up to a certain low? Because once you accept it and you change the time frame, you're going to fish it harder, which means that it may never come back if you were wrong and it actually had a chance to. So it's a weird, you got to make this choice somewhere, which is, I think, where you're going. And the SSC also had, you'll see, there's a number of working groups all that center around harvest control rules because that depends on recruitment and recruitment itself. And I won't say we punted, but we delayed until after we have the February workshop because our hope of that February workshop is honestly to talk about what are conditions, how are they changing, how is that gonna affect the stocks? And then is the harvest control rules that we have right now, are they effective? For the changes we're going to see because that's what's going to affect you with management and so our hope is to get two sections which are going to be real sciencey i think and then one which i think we're going to have a science view of what might help inform your management and then i think that there's going to be a time where we're actually all going to get together possibly at a later meeting and then you can help us understand and we can interact and try to figure out this in between which is going to be is going to be a judgment call, Mr. Twight. Thanks, Dr. Dressel. I, I'm. Um, I think it's timely. Um, I'm really glad the SSC is indeed focusing that. Decided to have the February workshop and propose that and is focusing it on this. I, I think it's extremely timely. I think you described why. Um, let me just try this a little bit on you back to snow crab now um so at, on the one hand our analysis is saying things like um snow crab for a long time has been one of those species that we've thought likely would be one of the sort of the first casualties of of climate change and loss of sea ice um and and so and what we're seeing now is fitting that but on the other hand, there's an explanation that even though climate change plays part of the role, population dynamics play a large part of the role too, independent of climate change. And so we're not ready yet to say that we're seeing that sort of perpetu the perpetually lowered state. Um, that, and so the, at least in the SSC's best scientific judgment, um, staying with the current productivity parameters for a while longer yet is still warranted even though we're also sort of expecting at some point it no longer will be because so far what we're seeing in the real world is still matching what our climate change expectations were that it was going to be tough on snow crab i guess i'm asking partly if if i've have i overly simplified the ssc's reasoning in that and then secondly Another, the other question is, and I'm kind of sorry for this, but is there a little bit of a disservice in into stakeholders and others in in saying that at this point? Um, 
because does it allow us to maintain sort of a false hope um, that people are going to make economic decisions around? Through the chair, Mr. Choi. I think that part of our reality that came up with in the SSC is that we had to cho choose a best projection now, which we did. But I think that one of the presentations that we've got, and I, I don't know if you got it today, but it was with all the it was with all the projections, two of which, depending on conditions, this may um, rebuild by you know, within under 10 years and six years, if there are other conditions, it's possible that it may never recover at all. And I think that somewhere in somewhere in our minutes and notes, um, we've said that there is a lot of variability with that. And I think that that's pretty key to recognize. Um, we knew our role was to tell you what we thought the best chance was, and that's what we've done. Um, but we do recognize there's a lot of variability in that. So um there's that and then um i think that's one key where we have said that we get to update this work plan every two years and i think that that's going to be critical as we observe more and then we can update as we go along and that doesn't help people project very far because if you're going to redo this or relook at it in two years it doesn't help a whole lot but that's i think it'll be important to do nonetheless Mr. Twig. Mr. Chair, I just want to make it clear, I'm not in any way second guessing or proposing the SSC take a different tact. It's an extremely difficult, I, I think my questions are largely designed to sort of get at this larger challenge that we have in front of both of us, the council and the SSC and, and some sense of the, how we're going to organize the, the, the tools and the decision factors that we need to navigate forward through it. And I really appreciate the SSC's really proactive role in anticipating that. Thank you, Mr. Twight. Ms. Kimball. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Dr. Dressel. I'm I'm back on that point that Ms. Dramika was asking about in the minutes. And you know, we have a mandate on how we define and look at EFH across the whole stock distribution. I see the difference that the SSC is is suggesting here, but I just wanted to confirm the SSC is not suggesting we look at EFH in a different way, but they thought this might be, this fishing effects tool might be useful in looking at effects, habitat disturbance across just the assessed area of the stock. Is that, first, that's my first question. That's a yes or no. Yeah, through, uh, through the chair, uh, we, we, we were not planning to revise EFH. That was not our intent. And then as a follow-up, Dr. Dressel, if you could, I'm trying to pinpoint like the additional, the asks for additional information that's really truly relevant to the rebuilding analysis and our decision points under that fairly narrow action right now. And so I'm, I'm trying to understand if this was critical for the SSC to see and help the council inform those decision points or whether this was more kind of in the research realm that we've been talking about on um, maybe more relevant to our crab work plan later in the meeting. I, I just need some explanation of the, the relevance. Through the chair, um, Ms. Kimball, I, the, So I think there are two pieces to that first bullet. Uh, so the first piece, I think, was our intent to, if the three point, say 3.8 percent that you saw in the last presentation is critical for your decision making, we wanted to let you know that the stock assessed area is only part of that, and that depending on what view you wanted, you may want an additional map of that to understand how much disturbance is in the stock area itself. Um, so that was purely to inform you if that can help in your decision making. Um, the second part of it, to evaluate disturbance in areas with higher abundance of small size classes. Um, 
I, I suppose that that could inform your decision making now. I mean, if, if your concern, but that part of it actually looks a bit more to me like future research. And, um, and I'm not sure that the SSC had a handle of how much we knew that not much research went into a rebuilding plan. I'm not certain we knew if any was. And so that could be our misunderstanding of knowing what's necessary in this plan. But I think that that would be um, looking forward because we're trying to figure out what impacts the stock. Ms. Kimball. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you, Dr. Dressel. I guess I have a, a pretty similar question and I hope it's not too repetitive on the ability to provide these projected catches during the rebuilding period, given the admitted kind of speculation on what that would look like. And, and so maybe I'm just looking for like, what's the strength of the SSC recommendation on this point? And there's, you know, a paragraph in the report, but if you have anything else there or, or help, help for the analysts, I guess, as they move forward, if they come to a point at which it's just wild speculation, then I assume they put that forward and then they get criticized. So I just wanted to understand how important this was to the SSC. Through the chair, Ms. Kimball, my sense to the SSC is in order to pro project or give an indication of what economic and socioeconomic impacts might be, doing a projection of the catch is very important. But like you said, I think the question is, how well can that be done? I mean, even if it's done moderately well, that would be the best available science. But if you're talking pure, spec pure speculation, then perhaps it's not worth it. And so I think that that may, I have my SSE chat here at on, not my ADF&G hat. I think it may be necessary to talk to ADF&G and see if there is a way to come up with a projection at all. Um, then the other piece would be, did I miss it? Um, oh, I did wanna mention one of the things that was asked in the SSC discussion of the authors was, well, if we don't do the projections, is it possible to say, for example, for example, under this level, these would be the impacts. Under that level, these would be the impacts. So not projecting the impacts, but just stating a few and giving a range of impacts. It was asked if that was possible. And the response that I understood was, yes, that would be done at minimum. Ms. Kimball. My last question, thank you, um, Mr. Chair, is on the last slide. Um, and inclusion in the social impact assessment. And, and it seems like that first request is really, I think you said in your presentation is more general. I mean, it, it came up in the SSC discussion under Snow Crab, but did I understand that correctly? The SSC is just looking for what is our process in any analysis if we search this new database that was created and we find nothing, what would an analyst do next? That's not very specific to this rebuilding decision points, but in a more general ask of the SSC. Okay. Through the chair, Ms. Kimball, um, I actually, I went back to our discussion notes and what we had said in the meeting was, um, according to my notes, was, um, oh, I thought I had it here. Essentially um, that the SSC encouraged reaching out beyond this in turning around minutes as fast as we could that did not make our minutes. So the formal minutes from the SSC just request clarification on the process. And I assumed that that would be in the future. Um, okay. Thank you, Ms. Kimball. Any further questions? Okay. Thank you very much, Dr. Dressel. That will bring us to our advisory panel report. Good afternoon, Ms. Mitchell. Good afternoon, members of the council. 
Should I wait for it to be on the screen or go ahead? Okay, great. Um, so the advisory panel recommends that the council select alternative two, option two, from the initial review as the preliminary preferred alternative for rebuilding Bering Sea Snow Crab. In addition, the AP supports the SSC recommendation on suggested additions to be analyzed in the final review, including added proje projected directed fishery harvest levels in the short term, along with economic benefits. And this motion passed unanimously 16 to zero. Thank you, Ms. Mitchell. All right, let's see if the council has any questions. Ms. Trabnika. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Lauren, for your report. Um, I was wondering if the, the AP, in regards to the second part of the motion, um, discussed uh, the potential limitations with um, identifying um, the projected harvest levels as you heard um, questions uh, likely regarding uh, that topic during the report um, and kind of what the the relative utility of of um, having a number that may be largely inaccurate or speculative would be um, to the to understanding the socioeconomic um, impacts of of alternative to option two. For my recollection, that was not discussed at length. I think there was some discussion around what a very small and limited fishery would look like and the socioeconomic impacts to the fleet and the communities, but not specifically to your question. Any further questions on the AP report? Thank you. Thank you. Okay, that will um, bring us into public comment. Looks like we have seven signed up to testify. So let's uh, maybe dip our toes in a, in a public testimony before we uh, break for the afternoon and go into our executive session. So um, first up will be John Yanni, uh, then Gretar Goodmanson. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Good afternoon. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the council. It's John Yanni uh, testifying on uh, item C2, uh, snow crab rebuilding. Uh, on behalf of the North Pacific Crab Association, uh, I just wanted to testify on behalf of the uh, Crab Association who uh, hold the majority of processing rights uh, privileges uh, in the crab rationalization program, both as primary processors of crab and uh, groups that hold uh, processing quota share that have their crab custom processed through processing uh, platforms in the Bering Sea. Um, obviously, you know, we're, we're uh, amongst the stakeholders that have been, you know, sort of trying to figure things out since the uh, crab resource has, has been uh, uh, changed so much. And we haven't really testified much as a, as a sector, but we are very supportive, obviously, of uh, any kind of season that we can have to try to keep the market supplied as, as best as we can uh, with this valuable resource. And, and, and we have lost some market share now already. And I think, you know, the market is, is uh, you know, gets, gets a little uh, scared when things like these things happen. So if there is a way to allow for even a small uh, crab season going forward, as is, as is recommended, um, uh, in the AP's motion and uh, option two, uh, you know, the processing sector would would uh, would support that very much. Um, I, I will also put in uh, at this point, Mr. Chairman, I know it's not on your agenda today, but um, in so doing, I think we, we do need the council's help in removing or allowing um, the processing caps to uh, to be set aside for custom processing agreements. Um, whatever seasons happen in the future during this uh, rebuilding period, they're likely to be pretty small and consolidating uh, processing into uh, a platform or two would greatly help the industry sort of survive this crisis period. So I wanted to testify on that uh, behalf and to uh, wish the council and uh, council family happy holidays and would be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Yanni. Let's see if there's questions. 
Mr. Twight. Thanks, Mr. Chair, and um, happy holidays to you, Mr. Yanni. Um, I appreciated your testimony about um, use caps and um, wondering if, two, sort of two-parted question. One is, um, is it just use caps or at some point does the council, a thing so small, the council has to look at regionalization as well is the first uh, question. The second question is just, um, is the association at least starting to think about what, what might be some um, actual trigger points for uh, when um, use the use cap structure might need to be changed? And I don't mean when in time, but I mean when in terms of uh, at, at what abundance or, or projected harvest levels would the council need to be considering um, altering the use caps? Um, thank you uh, through the chair, uh, Mr. Twight. I'll answer the second question first, if I could. Uh, I think we're there now uh, on, on both uh, red crab and um, uh, snow crab. And remember the council has already um, allowed for custom processing agreements to be outside the use caps for all of the other uh, crab species uh, and, and is considering on its agenda, adjusting the brown crab or golden crab use cap as well. Uh, I, I personally think that the quotas that we're at now, the numbers that we're at now, um, the use caps are too restrictive and too constraining. And um, so long as the uh, custom processing agreements are followed properly in terms of antitrust law, uh, the holders of the PQS are, are protected, but, but consolidation uh, would allow for uh, the more efficient uh, processing of those. Uh, with regard to your first question, I think, you know, fortunately the council has the crab rationalization program up, up for review again uh, in 2023. And I suspect that there are a number of, you know, items uh, in the crab rationalization program that should be looked at carefully given these uh, new and low uh, abundance uh, species that we have. Regionalization is a difficult one because it needs, you know, it was put in there to protect um, the areas to the north uh, from, you know, predation from the south and vice versa. So I think, I think that particular uh, uh, protection is one that uh, needs to be, you know, carefully, uh, carefully reviewed and any, any alternatives or changes that are proposed would have to make sure that the, uh, the areas in question um, were protected going forward. Any further questions? Thanks again, Mr. Yanni. Thank you. Happy holidays. Gretar Goodmanson. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the council. My name is Greta Goodmanson. Uh, I submitted a letter for you. It should be in your, your file or your notebook, whatever. And it, it is from um, uh, Randy. I, I'm not sure how you say his last name, Latine, General Manager of Marine Operations from Silver Bay Seafoods. And uh, I would just like to say I do support this letter. And I understand how important the tenders are for salmon operations throughout Alaska and know that many of them are crabbers trying to keep crew and boat as busy as possible and concur with their conclusion with alternative two and option two. For some of my own comments, <clears throat> I noticed some, uh, and I, I think it's another information from appendix one, shows how extensive the bottom contact is throughout Bering Sea but what it doesn't show is our reaction to that and comparing it to that of other nations and their reactions, noting that they have active and robust snow crab fisheries and we do not. In Canada, they close areas that they see soft crab, whether they, they see it in a trawl or in a pot, they don't care and they close that area. For how long, I'm not sure, and how they reopen it, I don't know. But that's part of their management practice. 
I believe Japan and the Kirols, they have a snow crab or a cousin, Greenland fish a snow crab. And I believe they have similar management practices as well as Russia. I think it is very important that we have the possibility, aside from that, for this year and, and this rebuilding plan, I think it's extremely important that we have the possibility of a season while rebuilding this fishery and perhaps looking at further management possibilities, whether it's similar to other countries or not, but um, what we're doing currently is not really helping things, I think, and we need to maybe look at innovative ways to get the stock rebuilt and, and keep the fleet alive while doing it. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for your testimony. Are there any questions? Okay. Thank you, Mr. Goodmanson. Thank you much. Okay, let's take um, one more testifier and then we'll go ahead and uh, break until executive session. Frank Kelty. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, do you hear me? Yes, we can, good afternoon. Good afternoon, happy holidays. My name is Frank Kelty, City of Alaska. I'm filling in for Mayor Tudikoff today. And uh, I just wanted to give uh, our support to uh, Alternative 2, uh, Option 2. Uh, we think it's uh, very important that if, that we, if we can have any kind of a directed fishery, it would be, uh, be, be very helpful to the situation the crab industry is in, uh, not just harvesters, but processors and, and communities. Um, the AP uh, approved the plan uh, 16 or their uh, recommendation was 16 to zero to support uh, option two, alternative two. And, uh, uh, and you heard just recently the SSC's report that they thought it was should move forward for final action. Uh, we think it's, uh, it's very important we get this through with uh, option two. Uh, like I said, uh, with the situation in the crab industry, uh, it, uh, any kind of a fishery, directed fishery we can have would be uh, uh, very helpful to uh, uh, for the economics, for the harvesters, the processors, and community members. So that's all I have. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Kelty. Any questions? Don't see any. All right. Thanks again, Mr. Kelty. Okay, well, it's 3.40. We've been going for a, a couple of hours here. Let's go ahead and um, stand down for public session for the day. We'll come back at 8 o'clock tomorrow morning, Alaska time, and resume public comment. Um, so, Council, I think we'll be back here at, at 4 o'clock for executive session. We'll see you in a bit.